Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias para hamzu todos. Me vale soralim. Welcome to our eighth annual Women's Summit, and welcome to all of you joining us here at PIC this morning, and to all of you that are tuning in on Zoom to join us at this great event. I wish to thank our beautiful Rafalawash women representing the Carolinian Affairs Office for gracing us this morning with their beautiful voices and leading us with our cinema anthem. I think that that start off adds value to our traditions and that I encourage each ceremony or event to open with our cinema anthem being sung so that it continues to live on for many generations to come. On behalf of our board of directors, staff and team at the CNMI Women's Association, I would like to respectfully extend our gratitude and appreciation to our governor, the Honorable Ralph Torres, for supporting our Women's Association, our programs and projects like the summit by providing ARPA funding towards our costs so that our mission and goals are carried out and so that our women of the CNMI benefit from its programs. We also would like to extend our appreciation to Mr. Kore Pugumuro Uludong and his team at the Office of Planning and Development for always being very supportive of our programs and for sponsoring our summit today. Additionally, we would like to extend our appreciation to the Women's Affairs Office Office of the Governor, Ms. Shirley Ogumuro, and her team for co-sponsoring our Women's Summit and for always being generously supportive of our events. We also would like to thank our First Ladies Foundation and the Lady Diane, Tor and Lady Diane Torres for gracing us with your support and for joining us at this important event. I would also like to recognize and applaud our guiding star, Ms. Felicida Ogomoro, for always being relentlessly supportive and passionate about our women movement and involvement in our community, and encouraging our participation on issues and matters important for our growth and advancement as women and as a community. Despite her personal challenges, she continues to champion our women movement by empowering us to take on active roles and part in building each other up and by building knowledge and capacity so that we can thrive and succeed in these challenging times. She joins us today via Zoom. Thank you, darling, for your never-ending commitment and dedication. We love you and this day is dedicated to you. At our summit today, you will be hearing from our panelists and their presentations on important topics and discussion covering women and peace, women and culture, and women and health, all of which embrace the very important issues that frame up to our mission, and that is to sustainably develop, advance, and improve our CNMI for the future we are preparing for and so that we're able to leave our community healthier and culturally, socially, politically, environmentally, education and economically resilient and stronger for many generations to come. I would also like to thank all of our network sponsors and volunteers and our MCs this morning for making this day already successful. Olomai, Sizus Maasi, and thank you for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of your day here at our summit and Biba Famalawan! Biba! Biba Shabu! Biba! Happy Women's Month! Yes, Biba! Sizus Maasi in the song. Atai Hinehi Nihatihan. That's a new word I want all of you to learn. That's thank you in ancient tomorrow. So thank Uncle Dalmo for that. So let's give another warm applause to our president and chairwoman for our summit this year. And thank you for the beautiful message. And it does um, contain all of the balance 
every aspect of our culture and our economy in our island. So without further ado, I'd like to call upon the co-chair for the Women's Summit, but also the Special Assistant for Women's Affairs under the Office of the Governor, Mrs. Shirley Camacho Ogomaro. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie Francis. Half a day, good morning, and Tito. I would like to uh, extend the appreciation for our Off Island guests, our Chinian delegates. Um, can you please stand so uh, our, our guests here can see where you're at? Can you please stand so we can acknowledge our Rhoda guests? Thank you for coming all the way here from uh, Rhoda. And uh, I believe we also have some Tinian guests too. Are you in the house? Okay, can you please stand? We have our Tinian. Thank you, Councilwoman, for joining us. It's really beautiful when uh, our women fly from the other islands to come over. And um, I believe we have others from Off Island too that are watching via Zoom. So thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Welcome to our eighth annual Women's Summit. This is really exciting because uh, last year, or we've been planning for months to get this uh, summit uh, kick, kicked off and going, but COVID had uh, made us postpone it several times because at the other hotels, the hotels were used as a quarantine site. So we wanted to make sure that our women and our guests are safe. So uh, finally we're here and uh, this is gonna be exciting. I wanna, Say that we hope that this uh, summit and all the information and awareness that are is going to be presented today will be something that you would take in your life and your profession and make use of it. So um, the topic that uh, Cecilia, our chair, had said the women of culture, women in health, and women at peace very important topics that relate to our everyday life. So we hope that you enjoy that topic and we make use of that. I'm not gonna take long here because our chairwoman said all the good stuff and that's one thing good about being the co-chair. <laughs> I just wanna say um, a quote so we can get started from Mother Teresa. You alone cannot, we alone cannot, we alone cannot do it ourselves, but if we cast a stone, we can create a ripple, a ripple effect. So that's us. We came a long way. History has uh, shown that women had to work hard to where we're at. And we've seen the difference from things that happened decades ago and today. In this time, we see a lot of women in leadership. We see a lot of women that are in key positions. We have the most women in our House of Representatives now. Our first female governor, Lou Dilan Guerrero from Guam. And the most women in cabinet. That shows a lot of success and what what uh, what our goals and our missions has, I mean it shows that we've been working on our goals and our missions to make that happen. Because this is for our future our daughters, our sisters, and our grandchildren. So I'm really happy that we have uh, different women group and organizations coming together every day to try to make that difference. Ms. Sablon had uh, mentioned that, uh, or she had shared some uh, events that happened with a uh, Women's Month. It's Ms. Famalan, Women's Month. So we started with a proclamation we started with other events, such uh, fun events to make uh, the Women's Month fun and exciting. So we had Colors Night, Culinary, we've had the International Women's Day on Thursday, along with Women in Recognition. So you see the, the pattern. We've done different recognition of women throughout the years because we are worthy to be recognized. 
we are worthy to be known of our achievement and our accomplishments. So today is our day, and it's still Women's Month. We've done Tinian um, a couple of days ago. Rhoda, you're next for Thursday, so we're excited about that. Um, so congratulations to all the team members, our partners who made today successful, and everyone that made the Women's Month a success too. And I want to thank our governor for his continued support on our leaders. I also want to say that our first lady is also a strong supporter. She's not able to be here today, but she's here in spirit, and she can also uh, view via Zoom as well. So this is a great turnout. And last, I want to say, just like what our chair said, I also want to dedicate today to our first Rafalawash representative, House of Representative, and she is also the founder of the Commonwealth Women's Association known as CWA. My sister-in-law, Felicidad Tamina Gumaral. So she has gone a long way to make sure that the, women's, uh, the women of the cinema are always recognized and that we keep achieving, we keep growing, we keep getting bigger and stronger. Thank you, Representative Sheila, for being here too. Um, so we have all these supporters. So um, in light of that, I want to say enjoy today and Viva Miss from Milan. Viva! Can all of you say Viva? Viva! Good morning. My name is Representative Sheila Jack Babalta. Um, I am very, very happy to be here today to share my story on how I've become a leader in this conversation. Um, and, and so, let's get started. Let's see if this will work. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. I am the daughter of Diego Regis Babalta and Dolorina Wilbacker Jack Babalta. I was born and raised here in the Mariana Islands on the island of Saipan, and I am a proud product of the public school system. I graduated from Kagman High School, and um, I was the first class to graduate from Chacha Oceanview Junior High School. And this is a photo of me at GTC Elementary School where I was Suka president in San Roque. So this is in San Roque Village. In 2019, I ran for public office. I became a member of the 21st CNMI Legislature with the support of my friends, my family, the community, and it was such a wild ride. I am still a sitting member in the House of Representatives. This time, I hold key leadership positions. I am the chairwoman of the Natural Resources Committee. I am the vice chair of the um, Education Committee. Our chairwoman, Rep. Leila Staffler, is here with us today. Um, I'm a member of the Ethics Committee, the Health and Welfare Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, plenty committees. <laughs> And I'm the floor leader for the SNILE delegation where we only entertain Saipan only and Northern Islands um, local laws. And so it is important for me to share that I do um, hold several roles. I am the chairwoman of the Friends of the Mariana Trench, Marine National Monument. I'm an Obama Fellow. I'm a Pacific Weaver with the Micronesia Climate Change Alliance. I support many, many different groups and organizations in our community because I believe it's really important to stay connected to nonprofit organizations because they have a really good pulse on the community. Boots on the ground, they call it, right? They're very engaged, face-to-face, -face, directly with our community members. Whoop! That agreed with me, too. <laughs> Viva! <laughs> I think, um, Mr. Ryan? Oh, there we go. Okay. But today, I really want to um, focus and share about my role as a board member on our Commonwealth 670. We are a grassroots nonprofit organization, 5013C, that formed at the 2019 Women's Summit. So, good things can come out of the Women's Summit, like this group. And 
We really focus on trying to help educate our community about the increasing militarization that's happening in the Mariana Islands. So the first time I ever learned about militarization was in 2019. It was just two months after I became a newly elected public official and there was a Navy public meeting at Canoa Resort. And it looked like this. So there were about 15 to 20 community members. There were um, boards here lined up all throughout Canoa Resort. Um, and there were military officials there just talking about the proposed plans for the Mariana Islands. And I was extremely overwhelmed. I could not believe the kind of plans that they were talking about for our islands. Bombing, sonar activity, training and testing, you know, and they were showing us maps that looked like this. And I was like, who can read that? You know, it's so complicated, so technical. They draw lines in our water and they tell us where they're going to be conducting training and testing activities. I was really, really overwhelmed from all of the information and it was one of the first times where I identified that there's a huge disconnect between the DOD and the community members because this was the first time I was ever learning about militarization in our community and I was really, really upset about that because I wish I learned about it in school. I wish I learned about how we're very connected to the military and how we have a long history and how we have the military training and testing already happening in our waters. So I did what any normal millennial would do after a meeting like this. I went home and I posted it on Facebook. <laughs> Share, like everything that I learned and it wasn't a popular post I didn't get a lot of likes for it or anything but you know I thought it was really important to help our community stay informed because women have been leading the conversation about militarization in the scene of mine says everyone <laughs> And you know, this is something I really wanted to bring up today. I really wanted to share that statement with you because militarization is not an easy subject to talk about. It is so heavy, it's complex, it's huge, it's messy, it's personal. My uncle, my mom's uh, baby brother, uh, Jeffrey Darren's Jack, he died in the war with my godbrother, uh, Wilgin Lieto. So, you know, we're very patriotic. I have many friends, many uncles, aunties in the military right now serving. And so when we want to talk about militarization, how do we do that when it's really hard to talk about and, you know, people get really, um, really emotional, right? So I really want to commend all the women who have, who have risen to the challenge to talk about this issue. People in the room today, like Auntie Juanita Mendiola, and Deb, Auntie Deb Fleming from Tinian, uh, Auntie Cinta Kaipat, Auntie Darling of Gomoro, I've learned so much from them. Um, there's so many wonderful women who have really taken the lead on talking about militarization and speaking up. So this is Retta Sue Hamilton. She's one of our founding members of our Commonwealth 670. This was at the 2019 Women's Summit, and she's my second cousin. I didn't know that she was very passionate about this issue, and this was the first time I ever heard her speak about it. And it was really inspiring to hear her story, and she did a lot of work on Guam with the Guam community around militarization. It was at this summit where she shared a video clip that really gave us an idea, a picture of what it looked like because the training exercises are happening. We just don't see it every day. We don't hear it, we don't feel it. And so it's very easy for us to think that it's not going on. And so I wanted to share that clip with you today and let's hope that it will play with 
So this is a video clip of FDM, a training activity that's taking place in our northern islands, where they're dropping bombs on one of our beautiful, pristine sister islands in the north. So after watching that video clip, a lot of us really felt like shocked, right? Like this is our northern island, this is one of our sister islands, and many people have never visited the northern islands. I had such a great opportunity to follow the mayor of the northern islands to Pagan, Alamagan, and Agrigan in 2019. So I've been to the northern islands and I see how beautiful it is. And when I see something like this happening in our archipelago, it really breaks my heart. Fast forward to 2019, I got to ask President Obama a question. And in this room of 500 people, um, he opened the floor for questions and we didn't know he was going to open the floor for questions. And I was sitting there thinking, what am I gonna ask him? I need to make it Bali, you know? <laughs> and the voice in my head just kept saying, ask him about militarization. Ask him about a hard question, you know, because this is the chance to ask him. And lo and behold, you know, Sami Birmingham Babata, she is the other Obama leader who was there in Malaysia with me. And she shouted at President Obama, look down here. And he said, hey, that's cheating. <laughs> and, and then he said, so I'm going to call the girl next to you. And that was me. And I was like, oh my goodness, here we go. <laughs> and so I have, a, I have a clip of that. Look down here, right next to you, over here. As a fellow Islander. Oh. <laughs> No, you got, you got, your, you know, you got your girlfriend, you know, called on. That's good. <laughs> Half a day, President Obama. My name is Sheila Jack Babasa. I'm from the Mariana Islands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My question for you is regarding the military presence in the Pacific Islands. With the relocation of troops from Okinawa to Guam, mm -hmm. there is major impact to come for the Mariana Islands and it is very serious. Although we are a very patriotic uh, community with one of the highest per capita of enlisted service men and women, we have died and fought in US wars. We also value our culture, our community, and our natural resources. But we feel like we're at the table with Goliath. How does one prepare to negotiate and encourage Goliath to come to the table where we can foster cooperation and coexistence to support national security mm -hmm. while preserving our culture and conserving our natural resources. Yeah. Well, it's a, look, it's a great question. So that was the question. I don't know how that came out of me. <laughs> my hand but I don't know exactly what I'm going to say so it just came out of me and I was like thank you Jesus <laughs> um, so fast forward to last year 2021 I got invited to go to COP26 in Scotland um, it's because of my involvement with many different uh, nonprofit organizations that these kind of opportunities come up and so that's why I really love being a part of nonprofit organizations and so they wanted me to come to Scotland to speak on several panels about the military's presence here in the Mariana Islands. I am no expert, 
You know, I just learned about this information like a couple of years ago. And so, of course I said yes. <laughs> of course I said yes, I'll come and I'll share what I know and I'm going to call on friends and colleagues and other people who are more, you know, they're experts in this field, they're more knowledgeable and they have the experience. And so, in addition to that, I continued to uh, to do my research and you know found organizations like Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, Peace for Okinawa. I have sat on several panels for Peace for Okinawa, World Beyond War, About Faith is a huge advocate. She speaks very loudly around holding the military accountable. I'm not gonna play it because I'm, I'm keeping mind of my time, but this is a documentary that made me realize um, that it's not just us. It's not just us who want to talk about this. And, you know, to come from a very, um, like, prestigious, a very um, credentialed person to speak on this and to share the information, that's really important because we know that we can trust the information. So we're just gonna skip over that real quick. And we're going to go into COP26. So when I went to Scotland, you know, I got to meet people from Puerto Rico who, who experienced the same thing, where children were dying, you know, the community members were dying because of the testing that was happening, and they missed the mark. So the bombs, you know, it really killed people in their community. I'm, I interviewed for that documentary that I just showed earlier, and that's Abby Martin, so I got to meet her, got to meet their team, got to meet other people who were interviewing for that documentary. We marched, you know, I spoke in, in public. I got to introduce President Obama, and it was quite an experience. I felt like my perspective just broadened so much because the people that I was around, they were sharing about military impacts in New Mexico, where the US Air Force has a huge jet oil spill. A veteran was leading the conversation about his experience in Iraq and how they would just bury tanks and bury bombs because there was too much. Like they were just making too much bombs. They couldn't bring it with them over the border. They just buried it in the ground. Like, what? I hope, like, that is, that was really like, new information to me, you know? So when we talk about climate change, when we talk about wanting to care for our world, we need to talk about militarization. After I introduced President Obama, I got to sit in a round table. There was only maybe 15 of us world leaders, and um, these young leaders from around the world, they were doing amazing things, you know, for climate change, for climate solutions, but nobody wanted to bring up militarization. And so that's why I did. <laughs> and so when it came to me, I brought up the fact that the military and militarization was not on the agenda for COP26. And if there's one thing I know, especially as a politician, is that if it's not on the agenda, then you cannot talk about it. You cannot make a comment on it, you cannot discuss it, you cannot debate it. And so I asked President Obama, you know, I have follow-up questions from 2019. <laughs> and I shared this story with him again. I reminded him this is not the first time I met you. I met you in Malaysia. I asked you this question. And, you know, I told the story about Sammy shouting at him. And, and so everyone enjoyed the story, but I was serious about my question. And I asked him if there were other spaces that we need to be aware of where militarization is on the agenda. Because that's where I want to go, you know. If it's not going to be at COP26, then where? Because COP26, we're talking about climate change. If the US military is the biggest consumer of fossil fuels, if they're the biggest polluter in the world, then why are they not on the agenda, right? Where are we talking about them then? And so I said, um, when he answered my question in Malaysia, he said, since I'm no longer in office, I can't just say, let's go back and talk. So here at this round table, I said, now you know someone in office, so can you please ask President Biden to call me? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, at the end of it, he said he would. 
So he said that he loved me. <laughs> and you know, it's because I flew so far. Oh my goodness. It was like 20,000 miles to get there. I had like six stops. I was rerouted twice. It's not easy to fly to these places, you know, just to have a seat at the table. And that's another conversation for another day. But that's the reason why a lot of Pacific Island leaders didn't make it to COP26. Because it's so far, we're going to leave our home, we're going to leave our community. It's expensive. And, and, you know, when you get there, what really, what kind of impact do you have, right? So by the time I got to Scotland, I said, oh my gosh, I came all this way. I'm going to ask whatever I want to ask. I got to say what I need to say, you know? And so, and so this was a very great round table and um, President Obama is definitely an ally. So I want to end today's you know, talk and conversation about how you can lead the conversation and how you can stay informed uh, because many, many of the advocates are on militarization, de-escalation, demilitarization. We honestly believe that this is one of the most important things that our community needs to be aware of because it deals with our health and it deals with the future of our Mariana Islands. So just three things. The first is follow us on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> our Commonwealth 670, we have uh, Dr. Isa Ariola as our chair. We have a scientist and a biologist on our board. We have um, competent, knowledgeable, experienced people who can share information, and that's the most important like key that I really want to I want to stress is that because militarization is such a sensitive topic, the information can be skewed so in so many ways, and so it's really important to find the information that you can trust. This is also a place where you can find networks because there are many groups uh, from Guahan, Okinawa, around the world, and we link up. Right? Because you have to find your allies. The second thing is keep an open mind, ask questions. There's a lot of um, different articles that come out ar around militarization in our region, very close to home. Um, and you know, when you read these articles, reach out to someone, talk about it. You know, women, the reason why Auntie Darling, Auntie Sinta, you know, a lot of us feel like this is an important conversation to have at the Women's Summit is because women are around the family the most. The children are around you when you're cooking dinner, when you're getting ready for a fiesta, when you're getting ready for church, you know, when you're babysitting, uh, you lead the home. And so, the people around you look to you for information, for guidance, or even just to see how you're going to respond, right? And you know, because militarization is so complex, and the documents are like 10,000 pages, those are the things that we can ask, you know, the professionals to handle, and we can ask the professionals to, you know, bring it down to just the key points that we need to know about. But it is in that manner that we can share it with our family in a way that is understandable, right? That we can understand it, that we can absorb it. Because if it's too much and too big, like people are, are just going to say, oh my gosh, forget it. I'm just gonna go to the beach, you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna relax. Like I have laundry to do, you know, like and so that's a reality. The third thing is to uh, go outside. I always tell um, our community, the youth, especially when I speak to kids, go outside because this is a part of the work. Going outside to remember why we're doing this work is so important for you to re-energize and like refuel because it's so heavy, because it's so sad to think that people are poisoning our water and destroying our land. We need to go outside to remember this is what we want to keep. This is what we want to share. And you know, it's for our youth. It's not just for us today, but it's for our youth. Because no matter where I went as a young adult, as a student, I always missed home. And I always wanted to come home. And it's because of this, right? 
So this is my nephew Josiah. His mom is in the audience. <laughs> Thank you for letting me use these photos. <laughs> because at the end of the day, I believe it's really, really important for us to be the ancestors our descendants will thank. Ooh. The end. Thank you very much. Sheila, uh, she needs to stay 10 more minutes even though she does have a session for Q&A's. She, um, I love it that she is like this with President Obama, <laughs> excusez-moi. I'm gonna teach him to cha-cha next time. All right, <laughs> not just cha-cha, the other right, uh, apuntas and poca, okay? So, uh, any, any questions because uh, Representative Sheila does need to leave for an important um, house hearing, session. Yeah, house session, With yeah, because our stimulus is at stake. <laughs> right? So, uh, any any questions? Yeah, any questions? Speak now or forever. Hold your peace. Okay. If you don't have any questions now, I encourage only 20 of you to participate in Women in Peace because there's about 60 of you I counted in the house. And only 20 can participate in Women and Peace. The other 20 needs to go to Women and Health and Women and Culture. So um, please don't all bust over to her presentation, okay? Because we need so to fun. share the love with the other important topics. No, the so, is so fun. Oh yes, it is. Uh, and she can story so she is a storyteller but she's coming back this afternoon and hopefully she can join us for lunch so that we can do one-on-one -on -one with her like she did with Obama <laughs> right so um, yeah. any questions no but I think you stunned you stunned the audience okay we have one from Miss Katie. Hi Katie. Hi morning. Um, were you able to uh, talk to President Biden? Man, you know what? My phone is never on silent because I'm not going to miss that call. <laughs> but no, I have not uh, gotten um, in contact with President Biden about it. We have gone through several channels because um, in this work, I found that it's really important to identify the different kind of groups that exist in the federal government where you take the appropriate avenues to bring up these kinds of conversations. And so we just look for all the spaces where we can be represented, right? We need to just bring our voice to the table. We need to let people know that we're here, that yes, we are a territory. Yes, you know, we play a pivotal part in the strategic plans for uh, militarization. And this is what we have to say about it. So I will keep you posted when he gives me a call. All right, <laughs> and we have another question from Eva. Um, thank you for all the work you do. I have two kind of questions, um, and maybe it's for the bigger group, but the first one is, as we continue to raise awareness about militarization, a lot of times, like when we find out all the information, it's very depressing, right? Like, even though we know all those things are happening, what am I gonna do about that airplane? Like, I'm just me. Or what is this whole room of women gonna do about those 20,000 airplanes that are coming from 15 different countries, right? So I guess that's one of my questions, right? It's like, after awareness, then what becomes our action? So, and maybe that's for the bigger group. And the other question I had was about, you mentioned, and you know, just like, again, applauding the work you are doing, representing our region in those conversations and in those spaces. But um, are you also, you mentioned about how the Pacific Islanders are not present at those. So is there also work being done to connect with countries like Palau, who had a nuclear-free Pacific movement and kept the nuclear weapons out of their independence negotiations, right? So yeah. are, are, we, are, are there also networks that we're building with other women across the Pacific? Because if the bigger countries aren't listening to us, then at least we can listen to each other. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank
Um, okay, so your first question. So that is exactly how I felt when I asked President Obama the question because it's so overwhelming, right? Like, what do we do? We feel like we really are like in this David and Goliath situation. And so he really gave me those exact points. You raise awareness, you gather your allies, and you unify your voice. And honestly, I'm still in those stages because we as a community, um, it's been really difficult to organize, you know, and and do that. So we raise awareness by doing things like this, right? We go around, we talk about it, we bring it into the spaces, we gather with our allies. And I think that is the best like answer that I have for you right now. Because when you gather with your allies, you learn from what they've done. And you learn how they can support you. So when I was at, at um, Scotland and I met with uh, the group from Puerto Rico, they were able to successfully move the military out of Puerto Rico. How did they do that, right? Like, how do they do that? How do you even get to that table, to that point? How do you um, negotiate? And so, and so that's really um, the process that I've been following. And it, it's a group effort because, oh my gosh, everybody has different ideas on how to um, address it. Everyone is so creative. Viva. <laughs> I don't know what that is. But, um, I think he was telling you to, to cut it because you have to go to your session. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, yeah. finish, finish your, um, your my response. Thoughts, thank you. Um, and then just to go into your second question about unity, right? That's so I really appreciated President Obama's answer because it really gave me clear guidelines, right? Raise awareness, gather your allies, unify your voice. And that's just what I've been doing. I just keep doing that. And so last week I was on a panel for EPQ. Uh, the chairwoman of that organization is former President Hilda Heine from Marshall Islands. We know all the devastating impacts that the military has had in the Marshall Islands. Um, and so, you know, just being a part of those spaces, it, it allows us to connect with our brothers and sisters in the Pacific. And that is really, really important because their lifestyle is more similar to ours, right? When we go to the U.S. mainland, nobody can really, it's been like, it's never actually happened in my life where someone can point out on a map where we are. Uh, they don't know where, where we are, they don't know that we exist, but in Micronesia, we know we exist, right? And so um, that's where I start. And I'm a part of a fellowship right now for environmental justice, where we're even narrowing it down even further to build on our allies in the Mariana Islands, because we don't, very, we don't speak very well of one another uh, when it comes to our brothers and sisters from Guahan, from Luta, from Tinian, right? And so we have to do the work at many different levels all the time. And, and so it's difficult, but when you're with your allies, they re-energize you too. And they help you like remember that it's possible. So next month I'll be uh, speaking in Palau. I got invited to go to Palau. Woohoo! My first time! <laughs> And so I look forward to you know building more uh, connections there and gathering allies on on all the topics that we really face as a Pacific island. Um, we are a very rare species. Us Pacific Islanders, we're like 0.0005% of the global population. We're very rare, and that's so special to me. You know that people. I've met people who have never seen the ocean. And here we are, growing up in a place like this. Like, what a blessing. And so it's really important to me to protect that for future generations, because I know that we can create and we can raise beautiful people to go out into the world and do good things. Thank you. And yesterday, when she mentioned Marshalls, yesterday Marshall Islands, Republic of Marshalls, celebrated their national day. So our, our thoughts and our prayers go to them. And so let's Thank give you. another warm applause for representing the Chief of Jack Thank you for, for
stressing your middle name, your mother name, your mother's uh, maiden name. And yes. so if you feel so fired up with this topic this morning, <laughs> make sure you stick around after lunch at one so that you can, you be one of the lucky 20 that will be participating in uh, that breakout session. The other lucky 20 also will be either with Dr. Lily or with uh, 500 Sales with Marjorie and her team. And so um, we'll spread the love. And so thank you again and uh, we will continue to talk. And um, as Eva was asking, we will be doing some action planning this afternoon. So the breakout sessions are very important because after you meet with your breakout groups, it will be coming together to report on the three different topics. And then we're going to have action plans that we uh, give to uh, CODEP uh, Ogomoro's office um, Uludong, Ogomoro Uludong, he's going to say, what? <laughs> but anyway, uh, to the um, to his office and also to the legislature so that those resolutions can be introduced and acted upon. So, so our voices today are going to mean a lot. So please stick around uh, for today. So uh, Representative Sheila, you're done? Yes. yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vincent Francis. And okay. hopefully okay. after lunch, we can give an update about the retiree bonus. All right. Oh, so you can come back for lunch. All right. So that's a date. That's a date. We're going to uh, hold you to that, um, Representative Sheila. And so I received an amendment to our program this morning. And so I would like to uh, beg your indulgence. And because this is an important topic, uh, the militarization, uh, we're going to go ahead and welcome to the stage uh, Juanita Mendiola, who is a, a Tinian women, uh, international women representative, uh, that will talk on uh, militarization. So that again is an important topic that is affecting Tinian especially. So, Juanina Jesus Mossi mi And so, here you go. Don't put it as Jesus Mossi. Oh. oh my gosh, I can't hold a candle to Sheila. I'm just a very helped brought the military to the courts to demand some answers from them with what they are doing a little bit of history so that we can put all of this in context. Um, in early 1990s, the Okinawa wanted the United States military, military out of uh, Okinawa and Japan, period. The Japanese wants them out. So they needed a space to move to. But instead of trying to figure out how to work with their allies, who they will be training with, to work together and trade somewhere else where the land is probably bigger like Okinawa and Japan and uh, where they can exercise freely without any restrictions, uh, NEPA restrictions like we have in the United States. What they did instead was they started out somewhere in 1995, the declaration for the Mariana Trench Monument was declared, signed by President Bush. And in that declaration, under the armed forces, it specifically says, the prohibition shall not apply to activities and, ex and exercises of the armed forces, including the Coast Guards. Number four, nothing in this declaration or any regulation implementing it shall limit or otherwise affect the armed forces' discretion to care, maintain, improve, manage, or control any property under the administrative control of a military department or otherwise limit the availability of such property for military uh, purposes. So it started out from this, and from this, they created the Mariana Trench Monument, and then from the Mariana Trench Monument, we went into what's called Mariana Island 
range complex, and that is a research area where they can do all kinds of exercises and training, testing their weaponry. And then came the Mariana Island training and testing. And that one expands the MIRC, and that expands the MIRC to include just about every area. The map that you saw that Sheila brought up here, the first map, that's the extent of how, how much space and which includes our land. And then following that, as soon as Okinawa started transitioning out the, the military, they came up with the Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth Military Joint uh, Training, as that's called CJMT. And that specifically targets into land-based exercises. But it does not exclude what is authorized under the Pew, what is authorized under MITT, what is authorized under MIRC. The good thing about this, we are not litigious people. Uh, we want to communicate and we want to negotiate peacefully instead of being combatants and antagonistic. This is our nature as Pacific Islanders. We don't care about how the world war, uh, fights their war. We only want to enjoy a peaceful life as, as we have had throughout our history. But we were insulted by being forced to bring the military to the United States, I mean to the court, so that they can be transparent with their actions. Uh, recently, there have been active discussions between Department of Defense and a few key, uh, key stakeholders like scientists, biologists, and all that from the CNMI to make sure that CJMT program is de-escalated. However, while that is working, everything that was originally planned under CJMT was transferred to a final environmental impact study analysis under MITT and MR MIRC. So my question is to them is which program takes precedence? Are we going to carve out CJMT and make it separate from MIRC and MITT? But at this point they finally admitted that they do not, they haven't defined the relationship between the three programs. Because I think I accuse the United States government that they have, they have compartmentalized these programs to make sure that we don't see the total impact of what they're trying to accomplish in our oceans and our lands. We've seen the devastation in that one little island that we have up there. That island is about to crack. Everything that's happening around here, they say that they're going to clean, but they haven't told us how they will manage that successfully. So until then, we need to be really vigilant and to make sure that the, one of the questions that came out is how do we fight against this? Start from the home, discuss it with your children as they will be taking the torch you left behind to continue the fight. And this is going to be an ongoing fight. As long as militarization is around, they will continue to, to conduct their activities the way they try to do here. But, in, but we have successfully managed to at least bring the CJMT program to a point where everything is scaled down or intended to be scaled down. I haven't seen the final analysis and they haven't uh, completed it yet. But I hope to see a, a total scale down, but at least the firing, the live firing range is now down to only one and it's only going to be small ammunitions. So the, the constant fight is always going to be there, but we need to be vigilant in digging out information and find out how they get to a certain point and hold them accountable and put them in the defense instead of being the offender. You know, so we need to be really standing ready and uh, I wish that I had time to prepare these uh, uh, an out, uh, what do you call that, an outline for you guys to look at? Because if you look at the map, 
If you look at the map of MIRC, MITT, Pew is right in the middle of it, and so are we. So I don't understand why, where the conservation effort comes in by allowing the military, their military activities inside the same area that we're trying to conserve. So on that note, I will take your questions. I'm sorry, it's so short. I wasn't really prepared for this. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. And remember, we do have an opportunity to speak uh, with each other uh, in small groups in the afternoon. So uh, we're not going to just leave the, um, the passion that you have and the, your thoughts uh, this morning. We're going to also continue it this afternoon. Any questions? If not, let's give Juanita a warm applause for speaking on behalf of the people of Tinian and the people of the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas because their concern, their plight is ours. So it, they, they don't stand alone. And so, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and go back. There are 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And the first, and I'll just kind of quickly go over it, the first is no poverty. The second is zero hunger. Third is good health and well-being, and that would be covered by Dr. Lilly. Uh, fourth is quality education. Fifth, gender equality, which is our theme this year. Six is clean water and sanitation. That was mentioned by Representative Sheila. Uh, seventh is affordable and clean energy. Eighth is a decent work and economic growth. Ninth is industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Ten is reduced in inequalities. Uh, Eleven is sustainable cities and communities. 12 is responsible consumption and production. 13 is climate action. 14, life below water. And those were some of the inputs that we had from the Pacific Islands. 15 is life on land. 16 is peace, justice, and strong institutions that uh, Representative Sheila kind of alluded to and also to, uh, Juanita and 17 partnerships for the goals. And so we are partnering here locally to make sure that we address these 17 or a 16 SDGs. And so we need to continue. Oops, oops, oops. Um, okay, you got it? I think uh, Ryan is doing a shuffle. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. Where did these SDGs come from? The world's shared plan to end extreme poverty, reduce inequality, and to protect the planet. And the goal is by 2030, okay? It was adopted by 193 countries back in 2015. It emerged from the most inclusive and comprehensive negotiations in the United Nations history and have inspired people from across sectors, geographies, and cultures. The main goal is to achieve the goals, again, by 2030. And in order to do that, it would require heroic and imaginative efforts. Just like what uh, Representative Sheila mentioned. You know, she had to kind of think on her feet, right? Uh, she did a lot of improv. And so we need to be heroic, and that's what she did, and she be was very imaginative. Uh, there has to be determination, and boy, did we hear determination from her, and also from Juanita. Determination to learn about what works. And that's basically why we're here today. And agility to adapt 
to new information and changing trends. And so we need to be updated. We need to make sure that we are educated. So the United Nations Foundation focuses on ideas and initiatives that generate larger impact, advance the SDG imperative to leave no one behind. Remember that famous motto, right? No, leaving no one behind, no child left behind, no woman left behind, and are backed by evidence practical commitments and action. And again, this afternoon, we're going to be action-oriented. So, individuals, innovations, and actions are helping the planet realize the potential and the promise of the SDGs. So, that's a summary of the Sustainable Development Goal and SDG 5 is also known as the Global Goal 5. Oh, can we go back again? I just want to read that. So basically, we need to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And that's why we're here again for this summit. Okay. So this is our main theme and topic today, and so that is what we're going to pursue. So, as I mentioned, uh, SDG 17 is important also, not just five, but 17 because we do need to continue to partner like uh, Representative Sheila mentioned. So, there are three reasons why um, SDG 5 is important. One of them is gender equality is a fundamental and inviolable human right. So it is a human right. The second importance is women and girls empowerment is essential to expand economic growth, to promote social development, and enhance business performance. And the third importance is all companies have baseline responsibilities to respect human rights, including the rights of who? <laughs> Women and girls, right? Thank you. And so, progress towards targets is measured by indicators, especially for gender equality. And so there are several targets, there's about six targets that we want to uh, pursue. And that is end all forms of discrimination against all women and girls everywhere. Another target is eliminate all forms of violence against all women and girls in public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. Another target is to eliminate all harmful practices such as child, early and forced marriage, and women genital mutilations. That does happen in the world. Another target is to recognize and value unpaid care and domestic work through the provision of public services, infrastructure, and social protection policies and the promotion of shared responsibility with the household and the family as nationally appropriate. Another target is to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership and all levels of decision making in political, economic, and public life. And the last target is to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights as agreed in accordance with the program of action of the International Conference on Population and Development, also known as the ICB, uh, ICPD, and the Beijing 
platform for action and the outcome documents of their review conferences. So those are the targets, the indicators. One of them, and the most, and very important is to again achieve, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Very good. So, we want to provide women and girls with equal access to education, to health care, to representation of political and economic decision-making processes, and decent work. And in terms of representation in political and economic decision-making processes, it will fuel sustainable economies and benefit societies and humanity at large. And so it is the comprehensive sustainable development plan of the CNMI back in 2021 to have a 33% of our women in the CNMI in political office by 2030. But guess what? Seven is 33% of 20, if there is 20 in the legislature. We have six sitting. So we are very close and we have eight more years to go to really meet the 2030. So I'm pretty sure we're gonna surpass the 33%. So, woo women, we're on the roll, okay? And so that concludes my um, presentation on and summary of the SDGs. So how many SDGs are there? 17. 17, and which one are we focusing on today? Five. Yes, you got to smart. Okay, so that concludes that portion, and so now, we are on a roll. I know Dr. Lily wants to go talk already, but we're gonna reserve her for the last. So let's welcome Marjorie for um, our next guest speaker. Thank you, Auntie Frances. Half a day, good morning. Half a day. Just to clear up on, I know uh, Auntie Frances already mentioned how Emma is away right now, but she does give her, her her deep gratitude to everyone and her apologies as well for you guys for joining us today and for her being unable to be here with you all. So as her staff, I've been voluntold to be here and present on her behalf. So these slides are hers and I've edited a little bit of it. So you'll hear a little bit of her story, but a little bit about myself. I'm from Tinian, so Shout out to Auntie Juanet over there, and anyone else from Tinian? Okay, <laughs> so it's just the two of us, and that's okay. <laughs> uh, what about anyone from Rhoda? Yes, yes. Rhoda. okay, yay, wonderful. I know my grandfather is from Rhoda, uh, Jose Atalig, since my father's Juan Atalig, and I know he had traveled with uh, uh, my grandmother, uh, to, or, his first cousin to escort her down to Tinian and he met my grandmother and he ended up sticking around. So, um, <laughs> my, uh, although my last name is Daria, you know, I'm one of six in my parents' household and uh, two of us carry my mother's maiden name. So I was child number two, child number one carried Atalik. I was uh, child number one carried Atalik, then I came along and she gave me Daria. Child number three came along, she named the child after her with Daria. Child number four happened. My father was smart enough to know that he should marry her. So <laughs> the rest of my next siblings became athletes from there on out. So big shout out to women. I know we can be really direct, but at the same time we can be subtle and know how to get our way in a, in a, very, uh, 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 in a very good way, right? So anyway, let's get into women and culture. But it's been a while since I've done any presentation, so let's see if I'm a little bit more technologically advanced as the people before me. So, okay, wonderful. So this is Emma's presentation, like I said before, 
and Emma Perez, because of her fair skin, was often known as the American lady in the village, or in actuality. That's her in the center. Uh, her matrilineal and paternal lineage are traced back to Pereira's, Leon Guerrero's, Flores, Diaz, and Perez. So she does have cultural roots up in Guam. Auntie Francis covered a little bit of the sustainable development goals, so this is just a recap to remind you guys of how that ties in to women and culture. And of course, the theme for today is on gender equality and why we're here today. While all of you are here today, for those of you guys on Zoom, whether you're women or whether you identify as women or are males, so we thank you all for standing with us today to empower women and the girls in your, uh, in your family to acknowledge the work and to acknowledge the work they do because it's more than just a nine to five job. Women are often in charge of the household and keeping things together and running. And of course, uh, these are all the targets, so I'll just briefly glance through them. Eliminating all forms of violence, ending discrimination are some of the targets we hope to achieve by the year 2030. Target 5.3, which I'm sure Dr. Lilly in Women and Health will probably cover in her presentation. And I thought this was, Target 5.4 was a really big deal in talking about a shared responsibility in the household. And there's a cool little figure that I found that I thought would be good to share at the end of the presentation. And I thought this was a really big deal, a huge shout out to Councilwoman Juanita and to Representative Sheila for bringing to light militarization and how this ties into decision making, which is a key uh, foundation for achieving gender equality. And then there are also targets, of course, universal, universal access to sexual and reproductive health, undertaking reforms to give women economic rights. And of course, information technology. As the world changes, so too must we adapt. And we have to do that in a way that also preserves our culture. And of course, strengthening sound policies that uh, enforce gender equality. So given these, for the recap, how do we know if we're making a difference, right? Of course, these are target indicators that are being measured. How does it affect education? How does it affect our ability to earn a living wage and representation in decision and political making processes, right? As we dive into culture, I do want to apologize in advance if, uh, if the version of the story I've been told may be different across uh, your clans or from the islands you come from. So forgive me if I blunder. And at the same time, I also want to give gratitude to where we are with 500 sales. A lot of the work that we do in this cultural revival of canoe culture would not have been possible without the help from our Carolinian brothers and sisters who have been with us and helping us uh, make an impact in our community. What this slide shows you, actually, are pre-colonization ceilings. So if you see to the west, we have Yap, and to the east, we have Chuk. These were sea routes that our people have traveled for thousands of years prior to colonization. What this map shows you is that we were one people. We were united. We traveled regularly on canoes right, to make trade, to learn about each other's culture, and to share each other's culture. And after colonization, this route, the Metawa Wool, uh, was severed. So the common misconception across uh, Pacific Islands and in a lot of the historical lore is that women weren't allowed on canoes, right? But a lot of the, uh, there was this article that came out uh, that discussed women on, and navigation. And while women were kind of virtually ignored, there's, and with colonization, a lot of the discussion about how women played a role in navigation hasn't been really discussed. And what allowed us to kind of try to figure it out was relating it back to stories and a lot of our, our traditions were passed down orally. So a lot of these legends and chants did refer back to women actually playing a role in navigation. So there's this one story, I believe, that Ma Piala came about and it was, uh, 
that women were the first navigators, and there's this particular legend that came out where uh, the sandpiper, right, the cooling, uh, was going from Chuuk to Marshall Islands and attacking and eating the people there, right? behind every version of a legend or some hidden truth. So however it manifested in the translations comes about a little bit differently. But the cooling uh, came to, I believe, what was it? Let me check my notes. Came to the Caroline Islands, I believe. And it was in this version, there are multiple versions. I'm gonna pick just this one. So if I'm off on your version, I apologize. So uh, with the cooling, it came down to this one island in the Caroline Islands, and the daughter of the chief, uh, the daughter of the chief was told to feed the cooling so that it wouldn't eat or attack the people there. So every day she fed the cooling taro and coconut water, and uh, you know the cooling started to trust her and actually fed her stories and taught her how to navigate. And when the cooling was satisfied with what the daughter of the chief knew, he decided to leave the island, he didn't attack any of their people. And in gratitude for that, the chief uh, told his men and his women to prepare a basket of food, of coconut water and taro for the cooling to carry with him. Unfortunately, the basket was too heavy that uh, the cooling drowned while in flight. So the gift of navigation was left then to the daughter of that chief who passed that, on, that knowledge on to others. So there are multiple accounts of, things, of stories like these that relate how women played a crucial role in the gift of navigation, in the gift of, um, of coming up with a sail and the mast and uh, onto the canoes. So it's, it's really interesting that while it's not being thoroughly discussed, it should be brought up. And, when you go out to Guma Sackman and any of our 500 sales activities, you'll see like what we've noticed over the years and we've taught our courses that women were the ones coming back and sailing and consistently coming back to sail. And this is just another version or another uh, account that supports how women have played a role in migrations, right? Because of the way how our islands have been affected by climate change, by typhoons, women were part of these migrations that have and have crossed islands in these canoes. And then uh, there's some accounts where the navigator, right, who's like your magus on your canoe, whoever's your chief on your canoe, right, and this canoe can only fit a certain number of people. So the navigator would often give up his seat to the women and children if they were on board his canoe. You have accounts from European navigators as early as 1521 where the colonization and subjection of our people to slavery, right? They had killed some of these people on these canoes and they talked about how the women there had cried for their people, for the men they had lost in those. So the takeaway from this, as we briefly reviewed, right, our target uh, indicators and our objectives from our sustainable development goals and gender equality, right, all of these relate back to our culture and our practices. So we think about how women were revered and protected prior to colonization. I'm sure we observe those practices now too. You know, uh, it relates back to how we want to end the discrimination, how we want to end violence, how we want to have women play a role more in the leadership and decision making making processes. So, how Western society have implemented a lot of their concepts and traditions you know, isn't the only way of being for us, and we actually have uh, this way of being where women were revered, where women were protected, and women played a role in determining how things should be, right? So women were on canoes and can grow even more in leadership and developmental, in leadership and maritime roles. So women were, in some language, right, women were navigators, women were chiefs, uh, and in some way or form, women have also, uh, it hasn't been very highlighted, right, but the role house, uh, housewives have played a role in, in their homes in taking care of the children and taking care of the housework and cleaning, cooking, being a chef. All of these are added up costs that have not been highlighted because they weren't bringing tangible sources of income to the household, right, like the way a husband would who was working a nine-to-five job and brought a paycheck. 
We want to ensure that women uh, hold assets and can com become more comfortable in leadership roles and we're very glad to see women stepping up and legislation and bringing up the conversation. Do you guys remember Sheila's uh, comment or quote on one of her slides that women were leading the role in the discussions on militarization? Right? That's a big deal. So that relates back to sustainable development goals on 5.4, 5.5, 5.7, 5.9, .5 and how it isn't just up to our leaders. Our leaders are there to listen to our input. So your participation today, your input, provides added value into determining how, where we go from here, right? and how do we promote gender equality. So going back to culture, what are elements of a successful voyage? We've listened to several uh, elders and navigators who mm -hmm. kind of have a different idea of what makes a voyage successful. Mm -hmm. So with Lino Olapai, does anybody know who he is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> so these are the things that he's come up with. Who do you want on your canoe, right? You want someone who's a spiritual person, you want someone who's funny, and someone who does massage. If you've ever been on those canoes at 500 sails, um, on our Sunday sails, with, uh, done by our master navigator, Mario Benito, if you've been on there for like 15 minutes, it's comfortable, right? But if you're there for hours, it can become a little bit, you know, you'll have to move around a lot, shift your weight, you know, lean on one bamboo with one cheek versus the other, kind of find a comfortable spot. <laughs> so having someone who knows how to, you know, alleviate some of your aches and pains is good. And then of course our master navigator, Mario Benito, who brings about Olaf's chant. So I know with some of our, our follow wash navigators, sometimes the translations doesn't work well in the English language, and the translation can come a little bit off, and sometimes you'll see these words come up, and you'll be like, that does not make sense, you know? Like, uh, English-wise. But a thief, you know? You want a thief on your canoe, right? Does that make sense at all? But the idea behind it was that you want someone who's resourceful, right? Who knows how to get things, right? <laughs> you want a diver who's able to provide food, right? You're out on this voyage. You want someone who's intelligent, who knows things. You want someone who's the opposite of a thief, right? You want an honest person. And then a magician on a canoe, magic tricks, anyone? And that isn't the, the, the concept behind it. The magician is the person who understands trends, right? Who reads patterns and know and can predict what's coming. So this is a, don't take the words to heart. Think about the meanings behind them, right? Because again, the translation from the follow wash language to, uh, to English doesn't go very well. <coughs> And then we have our master navigator, Cecilio Raikulipi, who has been instrumental in developing the lots in our sailing curriculum for 500 sails. And he has a different take on it. It's not so much the people, it's the energies around us. It's about the, the rainbows, the wind, the ocean. It's about our environment around us that will help make a voyage go safely, or reach its destination safely. So the takeaways from all these elders and from our navigators is that diversity is important on a canoe. You don't want someone like you on the canoe. I mean, it would go smoothly, but would you ever learn something? You know, would you be challenged? Would you grow as a person? So what we're trying to say is that, relating back to our SDG goals, right, with shared responsibility with 5.4, uh, you want to acknowledge the role that everybody plays into ensuring your voyage gets there, gets to your, your voyage is, uh, is headed in the right direction. 5.5, uh, you want women, right, to be a part of the decision-making processes. You want to empower women whose roles you may not necessarily think are, are important, right, just because maybe they're not saying as much, but you want to acknowledge the role everyone, or like the role women in your household have played, whether they were housewives or cooks or, you know, your cleaners or, you know, your, your supervisors. We want to acknowledge that everyone brings a different skill, you know, everyone has a different gift to share with people. 
and not just one condition or circumstances promises success. So if we relate that back to Cecilio, you know, he talked about the energies around you and um, how the energy of the people around you is going to determine your voyage, your journeys, right? So ending violence and things of that sort. Oh, they got cut off. <laughs> but of course, our takeaways from this, your major takeaway from this is that diversity is important and this shouldn't just be expanded to on a canoe, it should be expanded to your villages, to your communities, you know, to the legislature, to our country, to the world. So, as we think about that, we want to keep in mind that as the world evolves, as our customs and traditions change to evolve over time, we shouldn't forget where we come from, right? And a common saying that we say out of Gumasak when with our 500 sales is that the canoe gets here when the canoe will get here. <laughs> so anytime we make a voyage down to Tinian and they ask us, oh, when are you guys arriving? You know, we'll bring some people over, we'll do a little celebration, you know, we'll welcome you to our island. And the thing is, we can say, oh, it'll, it'll arrive in five to 12 hours, you know? <laughs> so it's a really long time frame for people to wait on there. But as we think about it, um, oh, this is Emma's story, right? As we think about it, you know, a lot of the times that we're subject to, to, to risk, we're subject to harsh weather, to sudden changes in, 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 our, in our weather patterns, that it isn't as straightforward as it is. So, Emma was waiting on P to arrive from Guam to Saipan, 18-hour voyage on the canoe, ended up being three days, right? And, and Emma, during this whole time, refused to call the Coast Guard to say that her husband was lost at sea because she didn't want to be that woman, she didn't want to be the American lady who called the Coast Guard to search for her husband because a part of her understood that the canoe will get there when the canoe will get there. So the, just briefly, this is a really quick map of uh, how our Pacific Islands uh, and how the canoes were introduced across each island. So you'll see out here in the Mariana Islands, tracing the migration of the canoes and based on archaeological evidence, 3,500 years before present, canoes arrived in the Marianas. And as you shift these all across all the way to Hawaii, canoes were introduced there 1,000 years before present. So the Mariana Islands is actually the oldest, oldest uh, settlement where the canoes have arrived first and developed. Cool, right? So our island time, or so because of that time frame, right? The canoe will get there, and the canoe will get there. Changing uh, modern times, right? Island time is something that comes up, and even my partner is often frustrated at the idea of island time. We say goodbye, we have to do our little tomorrow goodbyes. <laughs> and what ends up being like his American style of like bye to everybody, you know, it ends up me being saying goodbye to all the people that I know, wishing them well, and everyone trying to squeeze in at the very last minute, oh, before you go, this, 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 and that, you know? And the next thing you know, it's been already an hour, and he's there wondering what is going on and why goodbye isn't it just a goodbye. Right? So island time, relating that back to island time is just it comes from centuries of being used to waiting and not fretting because as you send your voyagers off, you know sometimes you had this expectation that maybe they weren't going to come back, you know? And you just had to be patient and trust that they'll, maybe they'll find their way back home, they'll discover new lands, they'll, they'll uh, or they might not come back, right? So island time not, comes not from inactivity, right, or this perception that being on time, being, being prompt, right, that, that isn't just the only way of being, which is often something that Western practices have adopted and how we've tried to adopt, but haven't been very good about adhering to, right? So it's just to acknowledge we come from different backgrounds, you know, and how we are with island time isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I think as women, we play so many roles, you know, with taking care of the kids, with trying to put the kids to school. I was the guardian for my sister for six months for a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. In South Carolina, that was hard. I, was, I turned from being the cool, fun aunt to like stressing out and waking up in the morning to prepare their lunches, to picking them up after school, doing homework, and then cooking for dinner, and then like putting them to bed, and then I had dishes to take care of, and I was doing that by myself, so. Being a mom is the hardest, most difficult job. And you want to hold a nine to five job and take part-time classes? Like, 
go you go moms, you know? So shout out to all of them. So where do we go from here, right? Conversation traces us back to women, how we want to increase the percentage of women in legislation because oftentimes decisions are made by males in power who don't understand the plight of women, right? Who are not at home oftentimes with the kids, although there are some exceptions to that, right? Right, we want to make sure that there are opportunity, training and opportunities for women who are at home, more than just the idea that they were a voyage cook, right? Women cook. And we want to make sure that there are culturally relevant activities uh, that center back to where, that relate back to where we come from. Right? So activities like sailing are at the heart of where uh, all Pacific Island nations are connected. So whether you're from the Pacific Island or you've chosen to come live here, this is your home and this is the history behind the place where you live. So embrace it. And then I just thought this was a fun fact, you know, because my mom took care of six, seven kids with us at home and my, my dad worked. And you know, like, as we, as we think about the role women play in the household, this is how much they make, you know? This is how much money you save. You know, and the fact that you're doing this on top of a nine to five job, this is how much you should show your husband or your partner that you're making that he doesn't have to spend on, right? So just, just fun fact. So this concludes my presentation. Sorry, I'm trying to find you. No, that was good, perfect, perfect timing. Thank you, that was beautiful. So if you can, we have 10 minutes worth of Q&As that Marjorie can um, try to answer. We've got April Ripecki in the house. She's one of the interns for the, the Seafair. <laughs> um, so Marjorie, thank you. Uh, Marjorie also serves as the secretary for the Inetnun Cultura Nativo Marianas, Kul Aramasal Marianas. So, Thank you, Marjorie, for agreeing to be that. Any questions out there? Let's give her a warm, warm, warm applause. A beautiful presentation. Thank you, Emma, if you're on Zoom land. Thank you for that beautiful presentation. And thank you for tying in the SDG5 and the targets um, you know, uh, in your presentation. So that was beautiful. Any questions? Eva? Question? Oh yes, Juanita has a question. Tegan is in the house. <laughs> I have earned the right to put you in place. Marjorie is like uh, my daughter. Uh, as she grew up, she grew up with my children. And out of all of our children, my cousin's children and I, she is the most ambitious one in, in the whole group. And now, uh, when they were little, I was asking her, I said, what do you want to be when you want to grow up? And she said, she wanted to be a doctor, she wanted to be a reporter, she wanted to be a, uh, there's various other things. I look, look, sweetheart, you can be everything you want, but you cannot be all of them at one time. <laughs> so, I'm glad that she's now realize, realizing just how difficult even to just manage the whole family uh, and also at the same time try to improve your outside of the family. Uh, I'm very proud of you. Uh, well, you have to, uh, well, you have up on, on your other ambitions. I don't know which one's the priority right now, but I'm very proud that you have uh, transitioned for a period of time to become identified, fully identified with who you are and your ancestors, ancestry and history. What I want to know is, uh, can you shed some light on how the transition was uh, for you during the time when you were giving up a little bit of your worldly ambition to try and focus into your history and how how you want to be a very, a very much part of it. Because I think that's the link that is missing with our youth. Uh, they look at the world as the possibility to grow outside of who we are as people. But I want to, to I would like you to share what your personal experience has been to transition 
from that ambition to uh, focusing locally. To answer that, I have any of you guys ever been to Tinian before? Right? No once? Okay. So it's not like Saipan, right? It's it's a little semi-rural, you know, you see cows on your walk down to to the down to the main village. You have stoplights, or sorry, you have stop signs, not stop lights, okay? <laughs> and everything was accessible within 15 minutes or so. I could even walk from school to the store uh, back when I was working part-time uh, in high school in 15 minutes, you know? And uh, so that was my world. That was my role for 18 years until I got out. And during that whole time, like, I didn't fully appreciate where I came from, you know, or, or what are, you know, just the benefits. Like, I grew up on a farm. I could pick up a fruit from the tree, you know, and that was, that was something I took advantage of. The beach was five minutes away of a walk. I took advantage of that. Like, I, I it took me getting out from there and going all the way across the Connecticut. Because when I graduated, I was like, I never want to come back here again. I don't want to come back this island, I'm, I'm tired of seeing all the same people every day, <laughs> you know, there's more to life than just cows and my family, and there's got to be something else out there, you know, so I was a major bookworm, or, or, yeah, I was a major nerd in high school, so I read about all these places and how I wanted to go visit, so when this opportunity came up for, for the scholarship over in Connecticut, I took it, and it took, uh, all those years where I got my degrees, I've traveled across the states, I've done study abroad programs to third world countries, that I realized that you know, a part of this, what I was missing and what I missed most was home and coming back home and you know, kind of trying to figure out where, where I came from and, and despite having all these ambitions, like I wanted to go into medicine and health, and it took me coming back home and working on Tinian that there is more to life than just my ambitions and health. I, you know, like how, when you think about wanting to make a difference in the world, you have to think about how do you help best, how do you best help your people, right? And a lot of that was grounded in my cultural identity and the people's plights, right? Like, and I'm sure Dr. Muldoon will, will speak about it a little, but what I realized while working at the hospital there was, you know, like we have all these preformed judgments and I was, trained in a westernized society where things were viewed at clinically, right? You had all these symptoms. How do you, you can't just treat the symptoms, right? You gotta think about all the other factors that affected how your people uh, got there, right? So it, a lot of it was just rooted on, on culture. And I really think I was missing that as, as part of my ambitions and I didn't understand the society I, I grew up in as well as well as I thought I should, you know? And I grew up with the mindset that being from where I'm from wasn't exactly going to be a successful thing out there in the real world, you know? When in fact it was just the opposite. But society had been ingrained, at least the society I grew up in, in this closed world, was on this mindset that the American way of being was the way to be, you know? And that was what was going to make you successful. So I focused on that, but when I came back, like, it isn't like what this presentation is about, it isn't the only way of being. And it's, I wouldn't say it's not necessarily the right way of being. I think it's, it's a merge, right, of preserving your traditional and cultural, traditional customs, your cultural identity, and adapting to the modern world. So being able to merge those identities and pick up practices that preserve culture as well as help people. Is that <laughs> Uh, you know, it was uh, understanding that the role, that the impact I wanted to make on my world here in, in the CNMI was really learning where my people came from, and that jump-started my transition from being in, uh, into being involved with a lot of the cultural work with the Netna and Katura and Aramasal Mariana's uh, Torah Medicine Group. It became grounded in being a part of 500 sales and learning about canoe culture and where our ancestral treats have come from, right? So I'm hoping that this period of time will better inform my later practices down the road. So, and that's it.
And uh, so, those, those of you lucky 20 that will be with uh, Marjorie and her team, 500 cells this afternoon at 1. So, um, kind of gather your thoughts and uh, write them down so you don't forget them so that when the time comes at 1, you can um, talk some more and come up with action plans to make women in culture work for us some more, okay? And so again, Another round of applause for Marjorie, for Emma, and Falcon yourselves, and women, and culture. All right. And then just a quick shout out to my 500 sales team. I have April Rapecki there. She's a dance practitioner, but who's taught me so much about their culture. Uh, we have also at the table Eva Cruz, who's our CMTC director, who's in charge of like nine, overseeing nine educational tracks to help make 500 sales an educational institution. So we are opening up training and certification. So really huge shout out to our team here and to my parents and to my and all the women who have played a huge role in helping us in helping me be where I am today. So thank right. you. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, 500 sales and Emma. And so without further ado, we save the best for life. Don't tell the others, okay? <laughs> so let's help me welcome Dr. Lily Mudun, who is the medical director of public medicine physician um, for the Commonwealth Healthcare Corporation. So without further ado, a warm welcome to Dr. Lily. So Dr. Lily for your patients. Of course, thank you for this warm welcome and good morning, everybody. I know that I am the barrier between you and lunch, but I want to take a few minutes here to talk about a very important topic to me, um, and that is women in health. And um, I specifically will be speaking about how reproductive health is key to gender equality and thereby is key to sustainable development. So um, my thesis is focusing on universal access to reproductive health and rights and what that means for sustainable development and for gender equality. And I'll be taking us through today really what reproductive rights and health means and what that means to you as individuals, what that means in, in specifically in the CNMI. And I'll be presenting some data information from our healthcare system here. So you can see how we have had some successes in women's health here, and also where we have some challenges, and where we can improve both individually and as a society to help women access more reproductive health services, and thereby will improve our opportunities for gender equality. So first, I want to make the point of how important reproductive rights are for gender equality. And when I first started studying this and understanding what this means, I didn't really understand what that link looks like. How is it that reproductive rights can lead to gender equality? Well, first, let's imagine reproductive rights as women's ability to access family planning, women's ability to decide when and how many children they want to have. That empowerment and that ability allows for women to have more control over their lives, allows for women to have access to education, have access to jobs when they want, instead of being stagnated sometimes by continuing to produce children when they could be advancing their careers, and being able to decide when they want to have kids and um, have that be something that they have power over. And that leads to gender equality. Simultaneously, gender equality also promotes reproductive rights. It takes all of us in society, men and women alike, to recognize that women need access to reproductive health services in order for them to be productive and empowered members of society. So let me explain it to you a little bit further here. I'll show you how family planning, which includes the timing and spacing of pregnancies, and the ability to choose the number of children that you want to have, can actually reduce economic burden it allows women to be able to, as I had mentioned, join the workforce when they want to. 
It allows women to be able to finish their schooling. It's the access to these reproductive health services that allows teenagers to finish high school, finish college, and then have kids. And so then it will allow women then to invest in their own health, invest in their children's health, to uh, get education, and then also to be able to access food and other health care services. And then with that, we're able to break the cycle of poverty. And all of this total here that I've shown in this chart is what sustainable development means. So back to our sustainable development goals. Thank you for my previous presenters who were able to clarify so much what these goals mean. That there are these 17 interlinked global goals designed to be the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. And yes, today our target is um, uh, the sustainable development goal number five, gender equality. And as uh, Marjorie wonderfully explained to us, that gender equality is broken down into several other um, key components. And I'm gonna be focusing now on the target 5.6 related to reproductive um, health and rights. So this is something that is recognized globally as a goal, something that is recognized nationally, and something that we should be focusing here in CNMI. So a little bit more about what reproductive rights are and what reproductive health is. And my point to you is that this is going to cross an entire lifespan. It starts with a little girl and will go until um, we're in old age. So um, reproductive rights is not just about um, access to contraception pills and family planning, but it also includes access to uh, sexually transmitted disease screening and protection from sexually transmitted diseases. It involves the protection from abusive relationships and having equality within our relationships and the reduction of domestic violence. And it also includes the access to sanitary um, care and menstrual care um, that unfortunately many women across the world don't have access to tampons and periods, uh, tampons and pads during their period and that can thereby reduce their ability to go to school once a month. And so we see, particularly in places like in Sub-Saharan Africa, that women have a decreased attendance rate uh, compared to their male counterparts merely because of menstruation. And all of this is encompassed under reproductive health and rights. One thing that I am focusing on today, too, is our ability to have family planning, our ability to have the timing and spacing of our kids in our own power, the ability to determine the number of kids that we want to have, and having access to this that is affordable, that women have ability to have transportation to the clinics, and be able to be provided cultural responsive care. That we here in CNMI have um, specific ways of viewing our access to care, um, and to be able to be taken care of by a provider that can recognize the certain characteristics that are important to us um, so that we can be um, accessing this care in a way that feels comfortable. And as I mentioned, this is a continuum across life. From being a young girl to an old woman, reproductive health and rights is critically important. And so we have to have the empowerment to know what their rights are um, part of this as well is cancer screening. We'll see later on how women's cancer is a um, huge topic that is often neglected around the world. And the burden of cancer in the CNMI specifically for women is enormous. And so part of reproductive health rights is women's ability to know when to get their screenings for cancer. Um, so we can prevent cervical cancer and breast cancer that is um, inappropriately impacting too many women. It also involves, the reproductive rights also involves the freedom from discrimination and harmful social norms that we can get caught up in and thereby will be um, reducing our ability to have reproductive right empowerment. So these are the things that I'm going to be speaking about today specifically and how we can um, reduce sexually transmitted diseases, how we can have better access to family planning services to reduce untimed or uh, unplanned or mistimed pregnancies, and also how we can reduce 
women's cancer. So um, this is a slide from CHCC uh, talking about the different services that are going to be offered for women. Who here has actually been to the Women's Health Clinic at CHCC? Good. I hope that many of you are raising your hands. Or if you're not at the Women's Clinic there, um, that you've been able to access here at one of the other private clinics, because a lot of these services are also offered. And as I mentioned, it, this is services that are offered across a lifespan. You should be accessing care from a child all the way up until your older ages. And that involves physical checkups, that involves an oral exam, vision exams, dental exams, diabetes screening, blood pressure screening, all of this is important throughout a lifetime. Specifically though, to women's health in their teens and 20s, we need to make sure that women are having access to STD screening and um, counseling and also to uh, regular pap tests. In their 30s, 40s, and 50s, people should be checked for cholesterol in addition to the other screenings that we discussed. And then that's also when we start doing the clinical breast exams, mammograms, and then the other um, screenings for other cancer that aren't just specific to women like colon cancer. And of course, I'll be focusing on uh, prenatal care and how important that is, um, that accessing prenatal care is critically important. Um, it's not just later in pregnancy that you should be seeing an OBGYN doctor. It should be rate right when you become, know that you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about sexually transmitted diseases. And this is a really powerful graph that I want you to understand because it shows how women are disproportionately impacted by STDs here in the CNMI. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a data from 2020. And it demonstrates um, the age group across the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the number of women that were diagnosed with this condition, the number of women and men. So the red bar indicates the number of females that were diagnosed with chlamydia in 2020. And the yellow is the number of men that were diagnosed with chlamydia in 2020. We have a, obviously a high burden of chlamydia here. We see less amounts of gonorrhea, which is another sexually transmitted disease. And you can see the, um, uh, the uh, gonorrhea is uh, purple for women and green for men. And what this demonstrates is that women are getting, uh, we're diagnosing women a lot more with chlamydia here. Um, in fact, about 80% of the reported sexually transmitted infections were found in women. And this is important because chlamydia is a treatable and preventable condition. Um, it can be prevented by the usage of condoms or abstinence, and it can be treated. If it goes untreated, it can actually lead to systemic infections and people can become incredibly ill. So if there's ever a worry that you may have a sexually transmitted disease, I encourage you to not be hesitant to come to the hospital or go to your clinic to get screened. So where can you get screened? I wanted to go over this for you in case you have any questions or concerns about it. Um, we obviously offer screening at, this, at the hospital. You can go to family care clinic, children's clinic, and women's clinic. This is completely confidential. They have a private way for you to be able to um, check in and um, be interviewed in a private room. Um, so I know that people have a, a lot of feelings about going over to the hospital. I know that you're going to see your aunties and cousins there. Um, so we try to make this as anonymous and, uh, as possible so that people can be screened and treated in, with confidence. Um, there we also offer our services in Rhoda and in Tinian. And our target population is teens and adults. And don't be hesitant to talk to your provider about this. I'm an emergency room doctor. I see patients come in all the time with these concerns. And I see people feeling very timid and shy talking to, about, talking to me about it. And, and it's understandable. Um, but I'm really happy and encourage people when they do. Sometimes I see people come in for another thing. They say, it says on the chart, they're here for an ear infection. I look in their ear, it looks okay. I tell them it's gonna be fine. I'm walking out of the room and it's like, doc, doc, what, one more thing. And that's when I know it's time to sit down and talk to this person. And maybe they're here because of another complaint. Maybe they're having vaginal discharge or um, abdominal pain or pain when they pee or have had a high risk exposure to somebody who is known to have a sexually transmitted disease and I welcome them to talk to me about it and talk to me openly and honestly. And I can tell you the other doctors feel the same way. We wanna help women with these things. 
And if you don't talk to your doctor and you're not open and honest about it, then you're going to continue to have these problems and it could lead to long-term um, yeah, long complications and we really want to prevent that. And then about the cost. Um, please, please do not be worried about the cost of STD screening and treatment. Uh, we accept insurance, uh, we accept Medicaid, and there's also a sliding scale fee for people who are uninsured or underinsured. Um, so it really should, cost should not be a factor for you. We have grants and subsidies at the hospital to make sure that people are getting treated. That is our paramount consideration, is to make sure that people are getting screened and treated when they need to, not about the cost of these services. So now I want to talk a little bit more about um, planning pregnancy. So what we have learned through recent studies is that having an unplanned pregnancy can actually lead to worse outcomes. What we have found is that unplanned pregnancies can lead to delays in initiating prenatal care. I'll talk more about why prenatal care early is incredibly important. Um, it can lead to, we've actually seen low birth rates. This is directly linked for women who were not expecting to get pregnant or did not want to get pregnant, that the health outcomes of their babies is actually not as good as if we we're actually having planned pregnancies. We see birth defects. There's a reduction in the likelihood that a woman is going to breastfeed, and we've known for a long time now how important breastfeeding is to the um, baby and for the mom as far as health outcomes. Um, we've also seen increased risk of maternal depression, and unfortunately, we've also seen increased domestic violence for women who have unplanned pregnancies. So, what can we do about this? How is it prevented? Uh, oh, sorry, one more thing I wanted to just to demonstrate about what's happening here in this CNMI. Um, this graph shows the percentage of births with early prenatal care from 2016 to 2020, and this is at CHCC data. And the purple line on top is the U.S. mainland. And this is the, um, about, a little about under 80% of women over time um, in US mainland have had adequate prenatal care. Now look at where we are in the CNMI. You can see here that um, the, uh, in the red line, about 40 to 60% of women are receiving adequate prenatal care which is not enough. We have to do better. And in my next slide, I'll be telling you about how we can do that. I do want to say, though, we can celebrate a little bit. We are seeing an increase over time. Between 2019 and 2020, we are seeing women accessing more prenatal care. And we can celebrate that. But we have a lot more to do. So um, in the CNMI, only 55% of live births were born to women who accessed prenatal care. So how, we, how can we access this? Again, we have the CHCC Women's uh, Clinic. We also have the opportunities for this in the Tinian and Rhoda Health Centers. Our target population are teens and men and women of reproductive age. And again, about cost, we have several grants and subsidies. We accept insurance. We have sliding scale fees. So accessing uh, family planning services as far as cost should not be a barrier to you. And one thing I want to emphasize too here, oh, excuse me, is that family planning is more than just birth control and family planning is for everybody. This is not just a women's issue. Women have control over their bodies and there's many opportunities for women to um, have prenatal, or um, to incorporate family planning into their lives, but it's also the responsibility of men to um, recognize that they too are responsible for pregnancies. Um, it's not just the women who is responsible for this. So I encourage all of you to continue to talk to your sons and brothers, nephews, about how they play a role in um, the birth control and uh, family planning. And so uh, family planning services are for um, women who are trying to get pregnant. We have basic um, infertility services, we have pregnancy testing and counseling, we have referral to prenatal care, we also have referral to many services for women who are getting pregnant. Um, we have the WIC program, we have breastfeeding programs, and simultaneously it's um, offered to those who don't want to get pregnant. So we have counseling, we have a variety of contraceptive methods, we also have uh, follow-up to make sure that those methods are working. Many women get on birth control and sometimes 
not the best option for you. And in my next slide, I'll be going over some of the different options. I encourage you to follow back up with your healthcare provider if you feel like this family planning method that you're using isn't working. Sometimes people have side effects to birth control pills, such as weight gain or fatigue or nausea, and that you don't have to live with that, and it doesn't mean that you should just stop birth control. Maybe another option is there for you, like an intrauterine device or a Nexplanon or a Depo shot. Many, many different options exist, and I encourage you to follow back up with your healthcare provider if the one for you is not the best for you because um, there is something else out there that you can try. And then again, we also have referrals to many different programs such as uh, tobacco cessation, Medicaid, and other services um, that are free to women who are um, showing up at our women's clinic. So now about the different contraception options. Many, many different options as I mentioned, and some are more effective than others. And so you have to think about what is best for you if you're interested in these family planning options. Um, things to think about as you're considering what type of family planning option you're going to select is whether you want to become pregnant again in the future. Because there's always the option of uh, sterilization. You can do a tubal ligation, which is um, basically irreversible. It, it can be redone, but this is the for the woman who basically maybe has had enough of enough children and has decided that they want to no longer have children in the future then maybe sterilization is an option um, we also have uh, things that i recommend a lot for women is the iud and that's actually a mechanism of inserting an intrauterine device into the um, cervix and that will actually serve as a barricade to stop any of the sperm from getting into the uterus and implanting and these will last anywhere, depending on which IUD you get, anywhere from five to 10 years. And it's highly effective. It prevents over 99% of pregnancies. And there's a few different options too of IUDs. There's the copper IUD that does not have any hormonal therapy in it. Um, and then there's the other IUDs, one's called the Mirena IUD that has a hormonal um, component to it. Um, and some women prefer that because it actually will reduce the period. Um, some people on that may not have a period. But then again, every woman is different, every body is different. Sometimes that type of contraception will actually promote more bleeding. And if that's an issue for you, I again recommend for you to follow up with your doctor. Um, there is also um, the hormonal ring, which is a, a ring that's inserted into the vagina that can um, add protection and is really effective against uh, pregnancy. Um, and then we have also the oral contraception pills. Those are a uh, pill that you take every single day um, and that can help prevent pregnancy. It has a little bit of a lessened effectiveness than the other options that I have mentioned. Um, and that's because you have to remember to take a pill every single day. And um, I just know from personal experience, it's hard to take a pill every single day. And so if you're not somebody that can remember to do that, maybe the um, oral contraceptive pills are not the best for you. Um, there's the diaphragm, contraceptive patch, a vaginal douche, um, other ones that are not as effective but can be options are actually planning sexual intercourse around your period um, and knowing when or when not you're the most fertile. Although I would say this is a dangerous me method sometimes because periods can be off throughout the cycle and this one does not have um, as much efficacy but has worked for other people. And then I do want to emphasize the option of condoms because the condom is really the only mechanism of birth control that will simultaneously prevent sexually transmitted diseases. So, um, even if you are on one of these other contraceptions, like an IUD, like the hormonal ring or the depo shot, if you don't want to get a sexually transmitted disease, you should still be using a condom because they are not protective against that. And I think sometimes that's a concept that's lost, particularly on our teenagers. They feel like they're taking their oral contraception pill and aren't going to get chlamydia. That's not the case. Please remind them that they should still continue to use condoms every time they're having sexual intercourse. Um, so just to speak on prenatal care and how important that is for women, and this is uh, one of our reproductive rights, is to ensure that women have access to prenatal care 
And one of the points I want to make, based off of this slide that we saw earlier, that only 55% of women in the CNMI are accessing prenatal care early enough, um, that I think people know they should see an OBGYN doctor, but they just don't realize they should be doing it earlier in their pregnancy. If you know that you have become pregnant, you take a home pregnancy test and it's positive, do not wait to make an appointment with your OBGYN. We would like to see you within their first trimester of pregnancy to make sure things are going okay. We'll do blood tests, we'll do an ultrasound, we'll uh, assess your uh, vital signs, we'll do a physical exam, we'll look at your risk factors, we'll look at your previous pregnancies, and be able to start planning for your whole pregnancy to make sure that you're safe and healthy. So I want to emphasize very clearly to you that if you are pregnant, please see an OBGYN doctor within your first trimester, and that will thereby lead to better birth outcomes, your baby will be healthier and stronger, and you too will be healthier and stronger throughout the pregnancy, delivery, and thereafter. So where can you go? A lot of the private clinics here in CNMI offer prenatal care. We also offer it at the women's clinic, and in Tinian and Rota too, there's prenatal care options. Um, and uh, again, we have many uh, grants and subsidies available, so you can be able to um, not worry about cost. We even have um, some opportunities for those who would qualify for transportation to the clinic. If that's a barrier for you, um, we want to make sure that you're getting in to see your doctor. And if you have any questions, you can also call our public health program. The number is there for you. So let's talk again. Um, this is my third point. Um, we've talked about family planning. We have talked about sexually transmitted diseases. And now I want to talk about cancer, and specifically women's cancer, and what we can do to help prevent some of these cancers. Uh, this graph that I'm showing you is a, um, the women's cancers, or to me, all adult cancers in this CNMI from 2007 to 2018. And so this is the percent of people who have cancer um, the specific cancer that they have. Now what can you notice here? There's something that was very striking when I saw this. And that is the number of women's cancers that are demonstrated here. Breast cancer. 23% of all people who have cancer in this CNMI have breast cancer. That is a women's specific cancer. It is possible for men to get breast cancer, but the vast majority of uh, people who get breast cancer is from is women. We also will see there's a you see another women's cancer up there, uterine cancer exactly 11 percent have uterine cancer, and then of course cervical cancer six percent, and cervical cancer is the one to me that just is the most devastating. No woman in this world should ever get or particularly die from cervical cancer because it is completely preventable. HPV, the human papilloma virus, is a virus that is a sexually transmitted disease and it is actually known to cause cervical cancer. And so we have amazing um, achievements in medicine to help prevent HPV and uh, also prevent um, or also to have cancer screening through pap smears and to prevent cervical cancer. And so we should be able to bring these numbers down dramatically. One of the ways that we can prevent HPV is actually through vaccines, and this is um, new in medicine. Um, over the last couple of decades, we've been uh, providing an HPV vaccine to both boys and girls, and it's important for them to get the vaccine before they're sexually active, before they um, develop uh, exposure to HPV, we can get the vaccine. And we're doing a great job here in CNMI on getting our uh, teenagers vaccinated with HPV uh, vaccine. And I think that we can celebrate that. And just want to make sure that you guys are aware of this. If um, your child or yourself qualify and haven't gotten the vaccine, please take some time to um, talk to your healthcare provider. But we can see here that, I'm oh, sorry, my graph is a little bit off, but um, we've seen a dramatic increase over from 2016 to 2020 of um, teenagers who've had the HP vaccine, and we're at about 96% of those individuals have gotten their first dose. So I have loved CNMI's acceptance of vaccines. I think it's just fantastic. We are doing a great job understanding that it is medicine and science that can prevent future infections. 
And so let's keep it up. Get your boys and girls vaccinated um, against all sorts of viruses that are plaguing us. Um, and so one more fact is that the HPV vaccine can prevent uh, HPV related cancers about 99% of the time, excuse me, 90% of the time. So where and how can you get screened? Um, I didn't go into all the details on um, who needs to get a pap smear, what age group to get a pap smear, when to get a uh, breast cancer screening. Um, but my point here is really to talk to your healthcare provider to find out if you qualify. Um, it burden is on your healthcare providers to making sure that you're up to date with your screenings, but ultimately it's up to you. It's up to you to make sure you're having your annual exams and that you're talking to your healthcare provider about when you should be getting these tests. Um, pap smears are the ones that are actual a pelvic exam where the provider will take a small scraping of the, um, the cervix and send it to pathology and can determine if these are uh, cancerous or precancerous cells. Um, usually the recommendation, depending on the individual age and risk, is that you should be getting a pap smear every three to five years. And that is key. Please don't push it off. If your doctor says it's time for a pap, make sure you do it. I know it's not comfortable, um, but it should be pretty easy and quick and um, can absolutely prevent possibility of um, having cancers in the future. Um, so where can you do it? Again, I don't need to be too repetitive. This is, can happen in order that we are accessing services and that we understand the limitations and the challenges of what reproductive health can mean, but also the opportunity to see healthcare providers and the vast number of different options we have for family planning services, for STD screenings, and also for um, cancer prevention screenings as well. We also have a responsibility to talk to each other about reproductive health. I know that sometimes this topic can be embarrassing, it can be taboo, but we need to talk about sexual health. People are having sex. It's true. It's happening. But if we don't talk about it, that's how STDs are being um, going unseen. They're not being um, checked. We're embarrassed if we're having vaginal discharge to talk to our doctor. Don't be embarrassed. Talk to us about it. We want to hear from you. We want to make sure you're healthy. And we also need to talk to our uh, male counterparts. As I had mentioned earlier with family planning, this is not just a women's problem. The burden falls on women, but it is the responsibility of men in our community to also take the role in helping make sure that we don't have unplanned pregnancies and we're not spreading extra sexually transmitted diseases. So I encourage you today to talk to your brothers, talk to your sons, talk to your nephews, talk to your dad about the importance of reproductive rights, and that is how we're gonna achieve gender equality in the CNMI. So thank you, I hope for questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Marie. Like I said, we saved the best for last because she had a bonus five to ten minutes <laughs> because of the timing, so we were able to do clockwork. So thank you, Dr. Lily. Questions? Uh, while I'm checking out the raising of the hands, and while I'm walking over to Marjorie, I do want to ask a question on colonoscopy. Do we have that service here now? We used to have it, but I don't know whether we still have it. Do we still have the colonoscopy service for those who need to go down that road, like me? <laughs> yes, we do. Very good question. Um, and I didn't really get into the other cancers that are not specific to women. Um, like colon cancer, but we do have uh, colonoscopy available at CHCC. And so talk to your doctor. Um, there are different reasons to get colonoscopies. Um, people who have high risk um, family history should be of colon cancers or other type of colon issues should be getting colonoscopies regularly. Um, and then your doctor will also be screening you once you get to a certain age with a fit test. This is basically determining if there's any blood in the um, stool. And if that's the case, then you should be getting a colonoscopy. And then at a certain age, we do regular colonoscopy screenings and they're all available at CHCC. Yeah. Hi, Dr. 
Dr. Muldoon, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, you raised uh, awareness about vaccinations, right? So we're thinking like guard cell for HPV, even vaccinations for COVID. And vaccinations and the idea of vaccinations is such a contentious issue, not just in CNMI, but also nationally. You know, like do vaccines cause autism? Do vaccines cause cancer or, you know, some other illness? Or even Gardasil will make teenagers more likely to have sex if they were given to it before they had sex, right? So these are, I know things are, these are issues that come up all the time. And people can do their Google search and you'll find evidence, right, that support each theory. So it's hard in the day and age to find the right information. So as a medical practitioner and an expert in that field, how do you navigate in your conversations with people about, you know, issues like these were that are, you know, that are contrary to, you know, what what vaccines are intended to be to be used for? So, Marjorie, great question. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, unfortunately, the uh, conversation around vaccines has is contentious and has become even more contentious as we have talked about the COVID vaccine. Um, and what I emphasize to my patients is that vaccines have been around for decades and have been proven to be show, shown to be safe. And um, I will talk about how there's been a number of infectious diseases that were wiping out the populations. And it was because of the development of vaccines that were able to stop those plagues, such as smallpox, polio, et cetera, um, that we're not seeing in our society anymore because of the vaccine. And um, I encourage people to utilize resources that are credible. Um, it's true, you can find anything that you want to see on the internet. And there is a lot of misinformation out there. I only use the CDC website primarily for my understanding of um, vaccine effectiveness and side effects. Um, and I encourage people to just use reputable, reputable uh, websites and information when they're making their health decisions. Um, I've been very impressed, as I had mentioned here in the CNMI, about the uptake of vaccines. Um, people have done a really wonderful job, not with just the COVID vaccine and getting boosted, um, the HPV vaccine data that we saw, but also the importance of having your children get vaccinated at an early age, too. Um, we are seeing a great um, understanding of families that they need to get their kids in to the doctor at a certain time and on time to keep their vaccines up to date. And um, beware of misinformation out there. Thank you, Dr. Lily. Do we have any others? Okay, we have a question up front. Um, Dr. Lily, just to kind of add to your information about colonoscopy, um, generally speaking, men and women at the age of 50 are encouraged to take their colonoscopy. And generally speaking, they say every 10 years from then on, you need to um, get your colonoscopy. But there are exceptions to the rules, and some need to have their colonoscopy before the age of 50, and some do need to have it every five years, like moi. Because my mother passed away, uh, and she had colonoscopy, I mean, she had colon cancer. So if you have colon, colon cancer in, within your family, especially from your parents, then you are at risk. And so you, you and I need to go in and get our colonoscopy sooner rather than later. So, question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this is from Monica Dioro on Zoom. Any thoughts on the heartbeat bills being passed around the nation? And what ways can the community and women especially protect body sovereignty and the right to choose? Um, I have to admit, I'm not as familiar with the heartbeat bills. Do we know what the, um, what the, it's not your question, it's one from Zoom. Does anyone else know a little bit more details about what, what exactly that is? Yeah, I'm assuming that's what it is. So they're pro-life bills, and um, so we repeat the question again then? Um, any thoughts on the heartbeat bills being passed around the nation, and what ways can the community and women, especially, 
protect body sovereignty and the right to choose. Okay. Yeah, I know this is a um, huge national conversation right now. Um, I will admit I'm not exactly sure of the specific bills that the um, person asking the question is referring to, um, but I think that this is um, a really polarizing conversation um, and a conversation that we're not really having a lot of here in the CNMI uh, about uh, access to abortion and uh, women's ability to um, ha get abortions or not. Um, so it's not something that we can really speak to what's happening here in the CNMI. Um, but I know across the nation there is a lot of concern about the possibility of Roe v. Wade being overturned, which is the, um, the previous legislation that has uh, protected women to be able to have free access to abortions. Um, so I encourage us to continue to talk about this here specifically um, because right now um, we don't have access to abortions um, and that's one reason why I was really emphasizing our options for family planning uh, because uh, that is our ability to prevent unwanted pregnancies before it happens. Um, and if anybody uh, wants to talk to me about this more later, if you're interested in having this conversation, I welcome you. Mm -hmm. And um, we can talk more about kind of the state of what's happening in the CNMI related to this and also what the future may hold. Great. Question by my co NC Mama Lou. She is in the house. Mm -hmm. My question is um, we like to get apps right, every, every year. And because of the I see the rise in the surgical cancer. Is there a reason why we moved it to every three years? Yeah, very good question. And I know this has um, been troublesome to some people. Um, and I'll let me just give you a little bit more background. So um, the both screening for breast and cervical cancer has changed over time. And we've actually regret, um, suggested that women not be screened quite as frequently. Um, so now the recommendation is for cervical cancer screening particularly, um, that they, if you don't have a history of having human papillomavirus, um, that you should be getting a pap smear um, every three to five years. And it was yearly. Um, and the, this was, the decision to change the screening recommendation was based off of national-wide population data, which demonstrated that we just didn't need to screen as frequently. Um, that there were, um, you can, if you get screened yearly, it wasn't picking up more uh, positive precancerous or cancerous cells than doing it every three to five years. And um, if you get tested and screened three years at three, at three years instead of yearly, there was still enough time to get, get treated appropriately that it didn't actually change outcomes. Um, so that's why there was that change. But people who are higher risk and have a history of having precancerous cells or having a history of HPV, your doctor may recommend for you to be more frequent. Thank you. I was going to make that point, but thank you for making the point, Dr. Lilly, that there are exceptions to the rule, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Question by Senator um, Edith. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read first a question that just came into my phone um, from somebody from Tanya. So the question is, um, do we have the capability to treat our patients, and what outreach programs do we offer, and specifically on um, the mammogram outreach program? Now, for my question, I'm glad you brought up the uh, topic of abortion. Um, I know it's a very sensitive issue, but my concern is because you're, sh you're sharing a lot of data, and I was wondering, considering that there's some cancer um, data that is shared this morning, has there been any situations that has happened to patients in the Commonwealth that were pregnant and then subsequently found to be having cancer, and um, you know, for some, for that reason that the fetus had to be aborted. I'm just wondering if there's any, any sort of data out there that's not been reported out to the community. I know it's a very sensitive issue, but I think those kind of um, information is very important to share to the community as well and the women in general. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. To answer the first question about um, opportunity for cancer treatment, specifically breast cancer treatment, 
Um, so we actually do have an oncology department at CHCC, which is new and incredible. Um, it is run by Dr. Peter Brett, and he has a magnificent team of PAs and nurse practitioners. And um, I think he's going to be changing what cancer looks like in CNMI. Um, they do a comprehensive cancer screening program and then also have opportunities for treatment. We are now able to do mammograms at CHCC, needle biopsies, and be able to um, have diagnoses. And depending on the type of cancer and how widespread the cancer is, different treatment options exist. Um, there is possibility to stay in Saipan and be able to receive treatment. Um, alternatively, if the cancer is more widespread or if a different therapeutic or chemotherapeutic agent is needed, um, there's also um, potentially the need for a medical referral to um, outside of CNMI for care. But um, I have been incredibly impressed by what they're doing with the oncology department and he does have a focus on cancer screening and prevention and also on women's cancer because he too recognizes that women are being disproportionately impacted by cancer here. And now to your second question, um, I uh, don't personally know of any cases where there was um, the necessity for abortion that was not, it's, a woman was not able to receive it for um, uh, reasons related to her personal health. Um, again, I don't think that a lot of this information is publicized um, because of the sensitive nature of this, um, but would be happy if you want to talk further about it. Thank you, Senator and, and Dr. Lily, for the response. One more question before we say the blessing for lunch. And again, you have the opportunity to talk with Dr. Lily and her facilitator on our breakout session. Okay? So the breakout sessions, we're going to have the Women in Peace and the Annex next door because just in case you make a lot of noise, uh, you wouldn't be bothering the two groups in this room. So we'll have Women in Peace over there again. We want the 20 in there and the reason is we want to spread the love. And we're going to have one breakout session here. And uh, Dr. Libby, since you're in this area, maybe we'll have you have this side of the room for uh, Women in Health. And women in culture, since you're over here, five hundred cells is here, we'll have women in culture here um, to my left. So uh, any burning question for Dr. Lily before we say grace? Okay, we have another question from Zoom. Or is it from PD? That's actually from me. Oh, from PD, okay. <laughs> oh. I couldn't help but notice that the uh, charts for the STIs uh, was disproportionately for women, um, and I just wanted to kind of know if part of the reason is unreported cases for males, um, or what are some other assumptions or uh, behind that data? Yeah, uh, another excellent question. Um, I think underreporting for males is definitely a possibility. Um, I think too that um, there has been proposals. We talk about this in the public health department with our um, team who's doing STD screening and. Um, those who are interacting with the patients. Um, and I think that women are more likely to come in to be tested. Um, their symptoms of chlamydia are sometimes worse. Um, and I think also that there has been proposal that there's um, men who are carrying sexually transmitted diseases are making the decision to not be using condoms. And if they are having multiple sexual partners, um, <laughs> then they um, unfortunately are spreading it um, exponentially to uh, thank you thank you PD for that question let's give Dr. Lindy another round of applause for, for such a, an impressive presentation On behalf of our wonderful representative Denita Yantimai, who uh, introduced this commemorative resolution 22-9, this resolution is a House commemorative resolution to congratulate and honor all the women in the CNMI as we celebrate. Where's 
Texas. Um, <laughs> celebrate their contributions and achievements during the month of March 2022, proclaimed as CNMI Women's Month, and March 8th as International Women's Day. Viva Samalawan! This is amazing. <laughs> you know, over lunch, um, Senator Edith was asking me, um, where is our guest speaker that's supposed to entertain us? I'm not going to share what we discussed, but because uh, I know we're, we're pressed with time, but I want to thank each and every one of you amazing women, women in our leadership, for gracing us this afternoon with your presence, your love, and your support. I'm pretty sure that the sentiment um, is the same with Ms. Tony. She just called us this afternoon um, to share with us that she is very proud of each and every one of us. And she would have been really happy to join us, but of course, because of personal challenges, um, she'll be joining us just in a little bit uh, via Zoom. So um, I want to thank also the recording team from Language Commission. Um, that uh, is recording this and we can play it back for all of the women that didn't make it today. But on behalf of the CNMI Women's Association, I want to thank each and every one of you. All of my, this is just my awesome. I want to echo what our chair had just said. Like I said, it's always good to be the co-chair. Um, thank you to our senator and our, our House of Representatives. Um, Viva Favalawan, and uh, thank you for this uh, resolution. It's a really beautiful flag and uh, uh, very fancy. So we're honored <laughs> yes. to speak on behalf of the Women's Affairs Office and all the women group and uh, my partner right here. So without each other, we're not going to be able to fulfill our missions and goals. So thank you for everyone that made today possible and joining us for the Women's Month events and, and everything else that we, we work on to. Uh, make to empower our women and to keep making those achievements and making that ripple effect. Yes. That's why we're here, right? So, um, salutes to everyone. Thank you. Dr. Lily Muldoon. Um, she did so awesome. And what I'll do to just start off just this whole um, reporting is to kind of discuss small points of what we talked about. So I'll just give an overview. Um, and forgive me because I'll be looking through my notes through all of this. We had such a good discussion that it was hard to just put everything together so quickly within five minutes. Um, so we talked a lot about um, just the difference or in Dr. Lilly's presentation, she talked about the huge gap between um, STDs within women and men. So we talked a little bit about that. So a lot about reproductive health and why the difference is so huge. Um, we talked about how there wasn't, or we believe that there isn't enough education and outreach on women's health within the school system. Um, and then we also talked about 
um, abortion. That actually took up a huge part of our conversation and just how abortion isn't legal within the CNMI, but our different perspectives on how we view abortion. Um, and then we also talked about just with gender equality in mind and that being the topic of our discussion, just sharing responsibility between men and women. If we're going to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, then we have to share the responsibility of conversations that deal with reproductive health. So including unplanned pregnancies, pregnancies, just the topic of sex, um, STDs, STIs, with all of that being shared between both genders. And so in, with all that being said, so we have, have conversations in reproductive health. So one of the solutions that uh, we thought of was the fact that even with this small discussion that we had within our tables, um, just putting out that discussion further out into the public and having more round tables, having more conversations on issues on women's health and how people feel about the topic of sex, really. Um, so just talking about having more conversations on reproductive health. And then in addition to that, we talked a lot, and I'll probably go a lot more into abortion specifically because it was one of those uncomfortable topics that we felt was such an important thing to discuss, especially because it's not legal at the moment within the CNMI. Um, and with that being said, so I had shared a little bit about what we do at the place that I work at, and we talk a lot about the age of consent and how the age of consent, there is no actual age of consent at the moment. Um, and when we had different roundtables, so we had a roundtable here in Saipan, and it included um, DYS, DPS, parents, um, students, and then different individuals from the hospital as well. So we talked about the differences and how they felt about the age of consent. And so we related that. So I was in Rota just last week, and it's interesting because you'll have parents, and they believe that the age of consent should be as old as 23. And you'll have students that believe that the age of consent, and this is more in relation to them, it applies more to them. They believe the age of consent should be 15 years old, as so as long as the person that they're consenting to having sex with is within a 36 um, month range. So with that being said, they were talking about um, tweaking the current statute of the age of consent, but with specific um, with little specific changes to the law. So with that being said, we were talking about how with abortion, it's a very uncomfortable topic, especially within the CNMI. We are, um, we have heavy values. A lot of us, we're a very predominantly Catholic um, community and religion comes into play when we talk about uncomfortable topics like abortion. So I had talked about how I had an aunt who had to get an abortion, um, and the reason she had to get an abortion was because her health-wise, she couldn't have a child um, without the possibility of her dying. But she did have other kids that she needed to take care of, and she was a single mother. So with that being said, when someone had asked, so um, Shirley had asked what our stance was on abortion, I raised my hand immediately, and I said that I am pro-choice with specific changes, just like the age of consent. So right now with um, abortion, there's a new change in um, technology and medicine. So there's an abortion pill that you can take within 10 weeks, um, and it's just a pill, you don't go through surgery, um, and it's still so early on in your pregnancy. So if we were to have that conversation of maybe the possibility of abortion and having that accessible to women here within the CNMI with that specific like clause or with that specific change within the law, then maybe it's a possibility. Um, and we also just talked about how with the work that I've done in the past, I've worked with a lot of low income families and I see how they have so many children, but they can't provide the life that I'm sure they would want to provide provide for their kids. 
specifically because of just their financial situation. But then a lot of the time, people who are also in low income and low poverty homes, they don't have access to that education on pregnancies and um, safe sex and healthy relationships. So with abortion as like a possibility, then that conversation comes into mind too, where you won't maybe have as many kids end up in the foster home or living a life where they could be not struggling as much. Um, so we talked a lot about abortion in that um, aspect and just, just bringing that to um, the court. And um, we had also talked about how because it's within the constitution, we would need to host a constitutional convention to change abortion and make it legal or make certain requirements to that. So the constitutional convention was one of um, the solutions that we had brought up in just the conversation of abortion. Um, and then in regards to roundtables, with me just introducing the concept of abortion within this conversation, um, and I'm sure a lot of us probably feel uncomfortable with that topic and we don't know where we stand or we may know exactly where we stand. Having roundtables and just seeing how the community feels, different people and different agencies and with the different clients that they work with, the different individuals that they work with, having roundtables and listening to what different agencies have to say in that regard so that we can contribute to making a change or a possible change in that, um, in our constitution. And then we also um, ended with the men's clinic. So we had a little conversation on how women or men are, if they need to get testing, they're usually referred over to the women's clinic and how maybe the reason why there's such a big gap between men and women and um, the reporting on how there is more STDs found in women is probably because maybe men don't feel as comfortable going into the women's clinic and getting tested. So just the possibility of um, having a safe space for men to discuss sex, to discuss pregnancy, to discuss family planning, and to just discuss safe sex as well. Um, and just feeling comfortable and in a, in a much better environment. Um, I believe that's all. That was a lot of conversation, but I hope that that helps contribute to the conversation and maybe everyone else in the community or in this room can add on to this as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. with women of different generations on their personal experiences and what aspects of our culture we feel that people in my generation, younger, or even just generally feel a disconnection to. So first step was identifying these aspects and these include language, which was number one, um, dance, arts generally, food, religion, um, balancing modern technology and culture, and in general, cultural and physical activities like sailing, storytelling, and weaving. So as women, there is this pressure, um, or a high pressure that they experience as mothers and wives because they have the responsibility to teach the culture and the language to their children, and also to learn the family backgrounds of their own families, but also their spouse's family. And the next steps um, that we identify uh, is social marketing of cultural practices. And this includes teaching language or dance or, or any of these aspects in, through the radio, TikTok, YouTube channels, um, children's shows and programs, apps, um, and cultural center. Um, and that is all. Thank you. <laughs> So now let's hear from women and peace. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so thank you to all the ladies who joined us in the annex back there. We had a really good conversation. We put up um, sticky big post-it papers on the wall and we had them go around with uh, post-it notes to answer questions. And we came down, we narrowed it down to three things that 
were most concerning to our group. And the first being transparency. So many um, in our community just are not aware. So we'd like to see a public education campaign, social media presence, and more um, interaction and connection with the Department of Defense, that's a federal agency, and the Bureau of Military Affairs, that's a local agency. The second um, item was cultural preservation. Because there is a language barrier, because Chamorro and Rafalawash are um, part of our, our official languages, we'd like to see more translation happen. Um, and village meetings with our elders because our elders are the cornerstones of our family and highly influential. They can help spread the word, spread awareness. And the last item is economic security. Because militarization often comes along, it's paired with you know, that um, narrative of the economy. We need the military for the economy. We want to see more reporting on what exactly that looks like because Oftentimes, it is a false belief that the community will become richer when a base moves into, um, into your community. Usually, the homes around the area drop in value because of the impact that the base will bring um, to your community. And the jobs that are generated are awarded to contracts from federal corporations and not really the local community, because we oftentimes can't meet the requirements to work on the projects. So, you know, I really appreciated the, the um, discussion we had. I'm going to take this. Uh, we're going to create a resolution. Uh, we had Rep. Danita and Rep. Karina in our room as well. And so we're going to draft a resolution with these um, targets and these objectives and we're going to introduce that in the House. Um, I'm sure we'll get support because really, all we're going to really push for is more um, communication, um, more public education, and transparency. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, but otherwise, thank you. I'm so grateful we're having these conversations today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Representative, you may want to uh, just stay, stick around and uh, assist me along with the facilitators. So you basically heard the reports of the three uh, groups. And, and let's give our presenters and facilitators another round of applause. We initiated the uh, conversations and, and by listening to the various breakout groups, you did an awesome job in, in engaging in the conversations. Now we're gonna have to do the hard part of selecting um, one from each of the topics or all of the um, top, I mean the issues uh, or concerns that were brought up uh, and, and present that uh, to the legislature and also to uh, the Office of Development. So, um, what are your thoughts? Do you want to add something to what you heard? Because this is also the time to do it. Yes. Thanks. Hi, my name is Leanne. And, you know, the reason I wanted to come today is especially concerning with the war in the Ukraine. And I, I feel like sometimes kind of powerless. But so it's really great to meet with women today, you know, kind of unite together with our common concerns. And I just want to read um, one highlight, or one, um, uh, Beatrice Finn, she's the executive director from ICANN, which is the international organization that has, um, it's an NGO, and they worked and they received a Nobel Peace Prize for their treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And there'll be a meeting in Vienna in June, so I hope you can go, Sheila. I hope so, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to read one brief paragraph from Beatrice Finn. She's the executive director of ICANN. She said, at this moment, one man is using nuclear weapons to blackmail the world. While he commits war crimes, 
Vienna will be the moment where the world responds and creates the global nuclear disarmament plan. Nuclear weapons impact everyone, and that is why this meeting will take place for all voices to be heard." End quote. So this meeting will take place in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the threat to use nuclear weapons at a time when the world is waking up from a 30-year fantasy where the nine nuclear armed states and their allies convince people that nuclear weapons could exist without ever being used. But this past month has made it clear that nuclear weapons do not prevent war, and nuclear war is closer than ever. The only solution is to immediately prioritize nuclear disarmament. And I really hope that as part of our group today, we can make a statement about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So definitely national security and a safety. Any others? Monica? Thank you. I just wanted to remind, I was listening in at the beginning on Zoom and wanted to align the summit goals with the SDGs and the way that we frame them, ensuring that they align with the, the and have um, clear, uh, measurable impacts and time frames that we could also, uh, it's great to have all these things listed out, but have it in a way that we can measure the impact and, and put a time on each one of these goals. So develop our objectives, yeah? Yeah, because that way the objectives can be measurable and then there's a timeline. Thank you, Monica. Any other comments, additions? Are we ready to to uh, decide on, on what issues we want to uh, present and uh, have the legislature continue to discuss and uh, formulate the resolutions or um, Yes, no, maybe so. Do we have to decide on just one? No, I, I said you can do all of it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, I'm just saying at least one. But I noticed that the different breakout groups did just have one. They have like plenty. <laughs> right? Which is good. Because then that means, and I noticed that there's reinforcement about outreach, education. So it's not just. Uh, women in peace that want that. It's also women in health and women in culture. So there are commonalities and they can be merged into one, but to also speak about those three topics. Yes. Uh, but the same kind of um, a strategy. Okay. So do we want to say we want all of that? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. yes, all or nothing? Yes. <laughs> no. Or do we want to to pick and choose. Uh, well, what is your sentiment? I'm, I'm hearing some of you say you want all of it. And raise your hand if you want all of it. So that um, our leaders that be in here and in CWA and the Women's Affairs Office can uh, work on that resolution or at least the language so that we can be presented to our leaders for action. No? So it looks like the majority, I saw the majority. I don't know, did you know, did you, um, yes. And so that's great. Let's give all of you guys a big round of applause. So, okay. so um, oops, I guess um, the slides don't want to work anymore. Anyway. No, my computer's acting up, so I, uh, so I apologize for my computer. But anyway, uh, you made the work uh, easy for me and, and our, our um, you know, planning committee uh, because uh, all of the, um, the issues that were brought up are important to us. And so therefore, we want to bring it to the table. And so thank you again to the women and peace. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> women and health. Let's give them a round of applause. And women and culture. Let's give them a round of applause. And let's give all of us a round of applause. And while we're applauding, we want to give Andu from the Caribbean Tomorrow Language Policy a big round of applause. Because not only is he uh, doing the 
Ron uh, videotaping, but he's going to edit it as soon as his um, machinery comes because that his machinery is broken. <laughs> so uh, the editing will be done and will be presented to our faculty. All right, Ms. Masiandu, and then we want to thank the uh, Mango, the Marianas Alliance of NGOs for uh, covering uh, this summit through Zoom and also for uh, having our um, ladies who are not able to make this especially uh, Auntie Darling, um, be able to join us through via Zoom. And so thank you, uh, Mango, and... Um, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before I go any further, I would like to thank all of you, uh, women and uh, men who are able to join us uh, today for this summit, for being here. And uh, uh, we are so happy to have you uh, with us, uh, celebrate our women, their successes, achievements, whatever they have done to make our community a very strong community. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more, but for today, uh, thank you so much, Francis, for uh, facilitating, for agreeing uh, with uh, our co MC uh, to uh, direct, uh, shall we say, traffic for today. I know that it's a very long day for some of you. Uh, some of us have to leave uh, to tend to other urgent matters. But all the same, I would like to thank our leaders from uh, uh, the legislature, both the House and the Senate. Uh, we uh, have missed out on some uh, people that were here in the morning at the opening. But all the same, thank you goes out to all of you. Uh, I think, Francis, um, uh, we are moving very uh, uh, well with uh, what we have uh, set up to do and that is to uh, uh, help in putting together uh, what we want to see included in the CNMI uh, uh, development plan, our development plan, sustainable development plan. Uh, and it's important because those issues, those concerns, uh, the goals that we want are already being echoed earlier and uh, this will be uh, further uh, worked on by uh, uh, the CNMI Women's Association, uh, the Women's Affairs Office, the Office of Planning and Development, and all of our partners, uh, Mango, especially uh, Francis and her team, uh, to make sure that our goals, the priorities that we have identified to work on and to be included in our CNMI Sustainable Development Plan uh, is done. So uh, that's all I have, uh, Francis, from uh, uh, myself and uh, the staff of uh, uh, CWA. I know that uh, my staff is uh, busy today, but uh, she celebrates her birthday. That's Leymal. Uh, so, uh, and uh, blessings on our very special day. Uh, Francis, did you want me to mention anything else before we go any further? Uh, excuse me, I, I think I, I forgot something also very important, and that is to recognize the board of directors for uh, uh, the uh, uh, CNMI Women's Association. They are the force behind uh, what, whatever uh, CWA is doing for our communities throughout uh, our islands. Uh, Saipan, Ruhr, and Tinian. Uh, so, Francis, that's all I have, uh, unless you want me to mention something else. This is Ms. Marcy, so, uh, darling, uh, I think you've covered uh, a lot, and, um, and I'm glad that you're able to join us throughout the day, um, giving us your support and your blessings. Um, uh, if there's nothing else in terms of comments from our lovely ladies here, I'd like to call upon our chairwoman, 
uh, for the um, planning committee and also for the uh, Commonwealth Women's Association uh, to give the closing remarks. I'm sure they were very uh, excited um, to have partaken in today's um, summit. I want to extend on behalf of all of our board members, our, co our sponsors, and our network of team that made today successful and possible, especially for our panelists. We thank you and appreciate the very valuable, valuable information we were able to share, take back, and make that next move forward within our goals and our plans and our objective. Today was a fabulous day. Um, it, was, it, it is amazing to see very supportive, uh, diverse group of women and to the audience also out there uh, tuning in live on Zoom. We appreciate you. Uh, join us more often in our uh, planning um, in, in the next summit or even in the next um, programs and opportunities to get very, very crucial, critical, and important conversations and information, like everything we discuss um, at today's summit. So with that, I want to say, Jesus Malasi, Parham Zutorus, Tomatna Uruguay Heavy, and thank you very much. I know that our Vice President, Ms. Joaquina King, is having technical difficulties out of road and was not able to join us today, this afternoon, but um, she sent me her WhatsApp speech, and I would have been glad to have read it. She was she wrote, she wrote it in tomorrow, but because we are Grace, you know, in the audience with our beautiful women all the way out from Rhoda, I pass that torch over to Miss Sandy Mosca. Correct? Is that Sandy Mosca? Yes. Is she <laughs> can kindly read um, the, the the closing remarks prepared by? Our, our vice president, I think it's a, I think it's a nice gesture, if you may. Maybe I'll have all my grocery ones and control from Florida. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for making a great order. Go ahead. Go ahead. Señora Ogomoro, buenas tardes. 